Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another thrill-packed, exciting edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. Today, folks, I'm another year older and continuing to baffle science. And the Wednesday Night Wars continue to baffle me. And plus, the great Brian Lass now has the yellow journalist on his back. All this and so much more today on the episode. And to join me in this, folks, he's a limousine riding, jet flying, podcast making, French toast bacon son of a gun. He was bred in old Kentucky, but he's just a crumb up here. The great Brian Lass. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Bread in Kentucky. Where did that come from? He was, you've never seen that Three Stooges short. They're the waiters at the, at the, the uh, Swank Society. But before the, the food fight starts, he was bred in, that's one of the toasts. He was bred in old Kentucky, but he's just a crumb up here. Which version of the Three Stooges do you like best? Oh, come on. There are people who love Shemp. Shemp, Shemp was a talent. And Shimp, the only the one. Hair. <laughs> the hair flying around. The, the hair, yeah. the hair flying. He was the only one that that forged his own path as a, as a single actor. You see him in, in countless parts in, in motion pictures. He was the only one that forged his own path. But yet, Curly is the classic third stooge. And don't even get me started about Joe Besser or Joe Dorita. Hey, Curly Joe... Do not even put him in the same category as Joe Besser. No, no. Joe just, Besser, those are unwatchable, those shorts. Because they lose Curly, all the slapstick. Curly Joe was the uh, Three Stooges comedy film equivalent of fake Razor and Diesel. It was, it was just, it was offensive. I find him less offensive than Joe Besser. Um... Well, you know, actually, because Joe Besser wasn't even, at least Curly Joe Dorita tried to be part of the group, I guess. He did try to to blend in, but Joe Besser was just doing his own fucking, the baby crying when he was 60. It just didn't work. It was pathetic. It was, it was dare I say, Jericho-like. Did you ever see the, it, the documentary? Um, I think it was called Hey Mo, Hey Dad, and it's by Mo Howard's son. And it's like all the home movies of the Stooges and the entire Stooge story from beginning to end. I never saw it. I never heard about it. I never even glimpsed a, an advertisement for it. What what mo can I say? It was on TV. It was on uh, maybe Antenna TV a few years back. And I DVR'd it and I had it. And then someone in this house erased it. And I'm still pissed about oh. it. It was phenomenal, though. It was someone that shall not be named on this. Well, broadcast. I have I have people I think did it, but I, I can't prove anything. Oh, so you haven't narrowed it down yet, and you you're casting a side eye to everybody, man, woman, and child. I don't know. All of a sudden, there was a bunch of Disney crap on the DVR. Uh oh. So it could have been the kids. I really don't know. But this documentary was phenomenal. It even had like some of the local television appearances, like on the little kids shows of the Stooges with Curly Joe. It was really cool. Really, really good stuff. Hey, Mo. Hey, Dad. It's good shit, pal. I had some good shit this week. I had, I had, did you know that if you eat an abundance of, of cake icing featuring blue food coloring that your shit will turn bright forest green? You know, funny enough. <laughs> This past week, we got bagels for the kids, and the local bagel place started doing these rainbow bagels where they dye the dough, and we gave the baby one of the rainbow bagels, and <laughs> the shit was... And, and the baby gave you back some rainbow diapers. Yeah, psychedelic shit. I've never seen anything like it before, but please go on. Well, I will continue, <laughs> thank you, as we're talking about... With different creative, festive ways, actually, ladies and gentlemen, that you can introduce food coloring to your diet and and decorate your entire bathroom. Uh, no, I had the cake. Uh, the birthday dinner was the the big ribeye steaks and the the fried scallops with the remoulade and the baked taters and the bin. A cake. I not only got a big cake, but I also got a big nanner pudding. A big, one of the Patty LaBelle nanner puddings. I don't know that she baked it physically with her own hands, 
I don't even know that it comes from her or a family member's recipe, but if she stamped her name on the top of that nanner pudding, it's good stuff. And I had some of that too. I enjoyed my birthday. I want to thank everybody Patty for the Bell. Patty LaBelle. She's got a brand of nanner pudding. Is that marmalade in there? No, that, 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 that was in her previous, uh, uh, she was once a French hooker, I guess, but then she became, <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, at least she's a real person. Not like, you know what I used to get mad at on the advertising, to be honest, is the Popeye's commercials where the, the nondescript black lady that was never given a specific name even was standing up there saying, I make my Popeye's chin. No, you fucking don't. You're not Popeye. You don't look anything like Popeye. And as a matter of fact, it, nobody's ever said that you had anything to do with this Popeye's chicken recipe. What you are is you are a, an actress cast to play a part because people think that black women that don't even sound like they're from Louisiana know how to cook chicken. So that was racist right there. But Patty LaBelle is a real person <laughs> who grew up in the South and would probably know about Nanner Puddin'. I'm so bad I eat Popeye. I was, yeah, yeah, and, and, and there you go. And, and sooner or later, <laughs> Mad Dog Boyd will come back and have his own brand of, of chicken and nanner pudding. Because he ate Popeye, so he was really bad. What the hell's nanner pudding? You mean to tell me that when you were a little boy, your mother never made you any nanner pudding? I mean, I had pudding. But your grandmother, my Aunt Lola, loved to make nanner pudding. My mother made a great nanner pudding. I can't she, tell. She, are you saying she, that it's made by a nana or that the actual name of the pudding is nanner pudding? Banana pudding, you oh, idiot. Banana. I have no idea what you're talking about. Nanner pudding. That's, that's what your aunt or your grandmother would make you some nanner pudding. I'll make you some nanner pudding if you're a good boy. You mean baby food? No. I mean, there's vanilla pudding and chocolate pudding. I've never had banana pudding. You have never... What? Oh, now... Never. Stop the presses. This is going out on YouTube. <laughs> you mean to tell me that you have never stuck a big old spoon and a big old bowl full of homemade nanner pudding and shoved it in your gullet and swallowed it down your fucking pie hole and yeah. reveled in the goodness of same? I'm going to actually tell you something that's... I now find it humorous. Suzanne loves it. She gets such a kick out of it. She can't believe it's true. I went like 30-something years without eating bananas. Because when I was a kid, at some point I saw, I think it was Friday the 13th, part four. Oh, good Lord. And the campers are driving to Camp Crystal Lake, and there's this person on the side of the road eating a banana, and Jason comes up behind her and like stabs her in the neck, and the banana just gets all like squished in her mouth, and she dies. And I said, you know what? That looks so disgusting. I don't think I ever want to eat these things ever again. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait, now, wait a minute. What? Now, wait. I can understand if you ate something as a child and it made you r r horribly ill. I, I, I had the Nestle's Quick projectile vomiting for me when I was <laughs> six, and that's been it for chocolate milk, right? But because you saw it in a movie that a fictional character, oh, for heaven. <laughs> A banana put doesn't even have whole bananas in it, you idiot. You you I don't know that. What are you it's, idiot? It's, what it's, is this? What are you one of the stooges? It's, it's banana. Yes, you what are you, idiot. Mo Howard? <laughs> well, let me tell you something, sweetly. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. It's it's put it's banana flavored pudding, but it's got the vanilla wafers in it, and it's got. Of, of, of some people make it with meringue on top. Some people make it at the the. It, it's it's a it's a it's in some cultures I understand called ice box pudding or something. But you have the the bananas chopped up in it, but also the pudding and the goodness and the vanilla wafers and the, and the whipped cream or the meringue or whatever on top. And you take it with a spoon. And you also you you take some cinnamon and you sprinkle that all over the top of it. And that just fucking just tickles your taint right there. And if you're going to eat a pudding of any description, banana pudding would be the first one that I would think that anyone would eat. Chocolate pudding. Now that looks like something you'd get out of a fucking baby's diaper. Dirty nappy pudding, they ought to call it over in the UK. So a couple of years ago on Facebook, one of my friends who works for the UN 
He just randomly tweeted, or not tweeted, it's on Facebook. He randomly posted, bananas are the healthiest thing you can eat. Bananas contain enough potassium to bring someone back from near death. And it was all these health things about bananas. And I said, you know what? That sounds all right. I'm going to go get some bananas. Oh, God. And I've been eating them ever since. But you've still never eaten any banana pudding. No. Dude, does anyone else call it nanner pudding or is it just you? Everybody south of the Mason-Dixon line would call it nanner pudding. But a, 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 again, so now you're just eating just plain old bland old bananas they taste for good. health reasons. Yes. Instead of instead of eating all the the sugary goodness and the creamy goodness and the the just goodness of nanner pudding. So your problem is the nutrition. Yes. <laughs> it's, like, it's like that time I was talking to you. You said I'm just eating some. What was it? A homemade granola? Well, it wasn't homemade. It was. It happened to be granola, of course. It was home. You said it was homemade granola oh, baked it may have in, been. The, in the oven. It may have been. Suzanne was making granola for a while. I wish she would start doing that again. So you were just taking just old things that cows graze on that you've put on a cookie sheet and baked in the oven, and you're just taking handfuls of them and just stuff them in your face, but you won't eat banana pudding. Let's not forget. Let's not forget for one second, Mr. Jim Cornette. Mm -hmm. You're the guy who won't eat an ice cream cone because your hand is touching the cone and your hand is dirty, yet you have no problem eating a cheeseburger with a bun that you're touching. Well, no, no. See, you, you've, you've, you've misrepresented this whole thing. How so? Because if you're eating a cheeseburger, that means you've sat down to fucking eat something. And that means you should wash your hands. Boom. But when you're fucking a kid and you're well, not fucking a kid, but when you're a fucking kid, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's separate activities, I guess. So in this case, when you're a fucking kid and you're getting an ice cream cone in the summertime, you've been running around swinging off trees and shit. And then you're grabbing this cone with your hand. You got your dirty hand all over it. And also, I never let the cone to me was bland and tasteless. It tastes like chewing on roofing tile. It was the receptacle in which the uh, the ice cream was delivered to your face. Not something, not a part of the food experience, for heaven's sake. So don't misrepresent my ice cream cone situation. I represented it. Exactly how it was. <clears throat> oh, you know, I was trying to tell people <laughs> that I really appreciated all the birthday wishes. I'm, I was actually also going to take some heat off of you and explain this show is even a day later than we had scheduled it to be because I was enjoying par my partial off time. I can't take a whole day off. I got to be busy. But I took most of my birthday off, still did some chores around the house. Uh, the day after my birthday, I did not watch any bad wrestling, but I did uh, complete pretty much everybody's orders to Cornette's Collectibles. We'll talk about that later. Uh, got some yard work done. The weather was beautiful. Uh, got some fence row weed whacked and, and, and trees, branches trimmed and stuff hauled. And I... I got away from recording a little while because I'm, I know people on Twitter have been complaining, but how can they miss me if I won't go away? And, and I enjoyed it so much that I increased it to Saturday also from Thursday and Friday. I had a three day party and I went back out in the yard because weather was beautiful here. So it was my fault. We're late, but I was wringing my brain out because as the big cat many times has said, your brain is like a sponge. And when it absorbs all the knowledge that it can, you must stop and wring it out. Yes, yeah, Suzanne, Suzanne was wondering what was going on with our schedule. And I told her, I said, you know that feeling you get when you come back from vacation and you don't want to go back to work? I said, Jim does not want to come back from vacation well, right now. It, it, I didn't want to even on vacation. I was just not talking, watching or talking about wrestling for three days. And I was out in the yard with all of my friends, the chipmunks and the squirrels and the possums and the raccoons and the deer. I did. I, f I fed the deer on Friday night and four of them came and had a nice little buffet and romped around in the backyard at, at uh, uh, dusk. So that was nice. But any, I also want to thank everyone for the birthday wishes. I got a ton of cards. I got some presents. I got all kinds of tweets on Twitter. And I would mention 
somebody, several of them, because we're so cool, except that if I mention anybody or even any of the items, I will invariably piss off everybody that I don't mention. And then I'd have to be sitting here reading a list like we were doing the fucking Jerry Lewis telethon. So I will thank everybody that sent stuff. You know who you are, and I appreciate it. And there were several cool things. But I will say the Cult of Cornet Facebook group as a whole sent me a big box of Sprite Zero in cans. So that was cheer, cheers to you guys. But some very other nice other thing. I even got a happy birthday tweet from good old Shitstain. Apparently, he must have needed some listeners that day. He hadn't cracked 400 on his his downloads that day, and he and he's happy birthday, Jim Cornette. Maybe one of these days. Dot dot dot. Maybe one of these days. Uh, what what's the end of that sentence? Sounds like you should get a restraining order. Yeah, maybe one of these days the restraining order <laughs> won't be active anymore, and I'll come find you and tell you happy birthday. Motherfucker, how about that? Or maybe what was it? What's it supposed to be? Maybe one of these days we'll reconcile around the time that you piss on my grave as you've publicly sworn to do. What's he trying to, you know? I don't, I, I don't think if a serious attempt at repairing a relationship this far south would be uh, the opening salvo would be fired on Twitter in public. Do you? But anyway, <laughs> um, Speaking of which, all of the orders, as I talked about a minute ago, except for six, six unlucky people that I'm waiting on a restock of, of a couple of items that are coming in tomorrow and uh, uh, just finished some DVD sets. But all the other folks, everything is in the mail. If you ordered through September 15th, it's in the mail, except for those six. And yours will be uh, in the mail on Wednesday. And the store at jimcornette.com is closed until October 1st, as we mentioned, so that we can continue to restock on not only merchandise, but shipping supplies, and also so I can have just a little mental peace and quiet. As Thunderbolt Patterson would say, if I only had time. Well, I'm, I need a little, I need about 10 days. <laughs> I need a break. I need a break. Uh, before the holiday season starts, we're going to have some new items. I don't want to reveal anything right now. I don't want to start a panic, but October 1st, the store reopens at jimcornette.com. And I would suggest not only because of I'm only one man, but also the postal situation in this country and the international situation, which as we've said, is anywhere from the normal 10 days or two weeks to four months or anything in between. Uh, so get your orders in early for Christmas. Give me plenty of time and plenty of, of break there. Give me a break there off the break that I've just had. I, uh, Brian, I don't think that I would have been in a proper temperament in a good frame of mind if I had not closed down for a, a couple of weeks just so that I could relax and, and get my goose fry by going and 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 be peaceful and and contented in my and a lot of puppy belly rubbing a lot of that calming calming influences on me because else if i'd have gone right into the holidays i would have been frazzled do you know nothing makes you feel better than to rub a warm puppy's belly did you know that it's certainly nice i don't know about nothing but certainly on the list I can think of nothing that makes a person feel better in a more contented state of mind than rubbing a warm puppy's belly. But folks, if you do not have an adjacent warm puppy belly that you can rub to feel better, then we got the next best thing. Our friends at BetterHelp, the folks at BetterHelp can help you if you need somebody to talk to, if you need somebody to communicate with, if you don't have someone in your local area or with an easy reach or distance or you don't want to go out because of the covid crisis the folks at better help are on video and audio through phone and the internet so you don't have to sit in a waiting room like traditional therapy they're committed to facilitating great therapeutic matchups as a matter of fact they've since over a million people have started using the BetterHelp services, they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. 
So you can go to the website, BetterHelp, that's better, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com. There's reviews and testimonials that are posted every day, but it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Financial aid is available, but they can help if you need somebody to talk to. Uh, A special offer, folks, as you know, because you're part of the family. 10% 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash JCE. Just use the slash JCE when you go to betterhelp.com. 10% off your first months of services. And uh, it, I get it, that's the next best thing to a warm puppy's belly. Would you think? Yes, I guess so. That was a well, tra- I can't transition have- out of nowhere. I had no idea where you were going. I'm thinking. I. What sponsor is the equivalent of a warm puppy's belly? Butterclaw? It's comforting. It- it's comforting. <laughs> it's it better help is comforting and a warm puppy's belly. You know what? If every, if every famous like serial killer and despot and dictator in the world had just had a warm puppy's belly to cuddle up to or better help to call on the phone, none of these bad things would happen in the world. Anyway, uh, speaking of bad things happening in the world, uh, and I'm not, I can't do this today because I will ruin the program, I'll ruin my mood, and I won't want to talk about anything else, but another catastrophe, a, a side effect of having the stupid people in our country elect the world's stupidest man, a criminal, psychopathic, psychotic obnoxious asshole as president of the United States, he's going to fucking get a chance to try to shove a a Supreme court, another Supreme court pick on and ruin the Supreme court for the next two generations. Lousy infested with conservative assholes. Uh, but I don't want to talk about politics on this program because I'm going to ruin my mood. And I want to let it set in for a little while, but early voting is starting across the country. I just want to remind everybody, vote.org has all the lists. There's a number of places have all the lists. But hopefully he won't get, I mean, the, the just the goddamn hypocritical pieces of shit that exist as the Republican Party these days, they, they screwed Obama on a competent, progressive judge that could have done some positive things for the country in the future for 30 years, nine months before the election. And now they're going to try to pass another one of these fucking caveman conservative fuckwits six weeks before an election and watch them try to fucking do it. I think we should all goddamn walk out civil disobedience. If they try to put another fucking crackpot on the Supreme court, Walk out of everything. Just stop the goddamn country in its tracks. But anyway, we'll talk more about it next week because I don't want to get in a bad mood. But what the fuck? Do we see now? And I'm ha- I'm three quarters of the way, by the way, for the birthday weekend through Mary Trump's book, which explains in detail exactly why that this fuck is like he is why he will never change, why that their entire family, pretty much all of them, were mentally fucked because of their family. And I wish she had written this before the previous election, but we're being warned again. Everything that you see him do and say comes from his fucking ridiculously demented and warped family and childhood and it's perfectly explicable now that you you see this in print from a psychologist because that's what she is so she actually got a chance to observe the biggest lunatic in the history of our fucking country up close in in some of his formative years oh joy anyway but i'm not going to talk about politics today we're back So, normally, Brian, it's me that has the fucking trolls and the wannabes and the jock sniffers and and what what do the kids say? The clout chasers, the people who try to aggrandize themselves, make themselves important like they are somebody 
their word means something, their opinions are valid and important, when in actuality they dwell in basements and sheds, have poor personal grooming habits that are socially awkward to the extreme, and also apparently have serious problems with fucking trying to figure out which kind of doctor to go to next. They're on you now. <laughs> They're on you now. We, we've both gotten so, so big and so important here that now they're, they're, it started with me. Now he's on you. Well, you, bitch, say, the, you say bitch, they, it's he. Well, well, one of them now. Bitch the journalist. We've talked about him here on the program before. He, we don't give his real name because then people can look him up and that makes him nervous. I, I, I retweeted a picture that somebody sent of him, uh, tweeted one time. And I understand he had to hire three private investigators and four personal security fucking teams because he thought that, oh, my God, everybody knows. If I looked like that, too, I would be upset, right, to be honest with you. He looks like it. somebody dropped a fucking big blob of goddamn Jergens baby lotion into the fucking pubic hair that you've just shaved off after you fucked a sheep. And, and he desperately needs to use Manscaped. But anyway... So he started off knocking me, and now he's knocking you, Brian. Welcome to the club. Bitch the journalist, you're on his list. Somebody said on Twitter he's a guy he has a face like a blistered piss pot. Yeah, I don't know how much you want me to say, how much you don't want me to say. I want uh, anything you'd like to say about this fucking cretinous, obnoxious, fucking basement-dwelling moron who's never not only been laid but never been on a date. Actually, I've heard never driven a car. Is this true? Yeah, no, this is true. He's um, only in his mid-30s, though. Let me say this. I'm going to say a few things. It's, it's going to take a few minutes here. I got time. Stop me if I say anything that's incorrect, because you know a lot of the things that were going on behind the scenes with me, and obviously he was involved with this show, which I'll explain in a second. If I say anything that is even remotely wrong, stop me and correct me. I will jerk you right back to reality. Now, you won't use his name. I'm going to use his fucking name. <laughs> well, God damn it. Yenta Bixenspan, <laughs> who I've known longer than everyone in wrestling. I've known him since he was in a fucking baby carriage when he was wheeled into my first grade class for his sister's birthday party. I've known him a long time. I know his family. I've been to his house. I'm not just someone who is talking about someone else on the internet that they've never actually met before. I know the fucking guy. I know him better than everyone else in wrestling. And I started 605 with him several years back. And let me start with that story real quick, if you don't mind, Jim. Oh, but please, feel free. In the summer of 2015, I was listening to wrestling podcasts, and I was thoroughly unimpressed with everything I heard. Steve Austin was the biggest thing at that point, and his shows were hit and miss. If it was Steve Austin with a guest, it was probably good. If it was Steve Austin and his neighbor driving around their ranch, it was probably awful. Your shows were hit and miss because you had a co-host who didn't do it for me as someone who cares about wrestling history. And well, apparently she did it for everybody else, but go ahead. I don't know. Go ahead. Well, with that being said, Ric Flair. I'm not, I'm not saying what it was, though. It, was, it right. wasn't producing a good sounding podcast, but I've right. heard that she did it for a lot of people. Ric Flair had a show at the time that was really disappointing because you wanted more from Ric Flair and it just, it wasn't there. And I felt that there was a need for something with a real historical slant that could be done seriously. And I started putting the plans together for a show that I was going to call Shoot Kick. And the way it was going to go was I was going to tackle a wrestling historical moment or interlude on each episode with fresh audio of the people who were involved with it being interviewed archival audio where available if you can't get the actual person and the end of the show it would be me and a wrestling journalist discussing what we just talked about kind of putting the uh you know the nail in the coffin i guess so to speak (laughs) the exclamation point on the sentence might be a better more apropos analogy well the person i was talking about doing this with was yenta bixenspan because i knew him i knew him for years And I wasn't actively involved in anything in wrestling. I knew he stirred the pot and got people fired up. At one point, he had to ask me to go on the Wrestling Observer Figure 4 message board and defend him because he started some problem and everyone jumped on him as they should have. 
and he was not able to deal with it and he needed someone to help him. And I actually did that as a favor that one time. But basically, here's the thing, just like it was my previous producer, you needed someone with no life available anytime you needed them to record your program. No, I wouldn't even say that. I'm going to be fair. <laughs> I thought, here's someone, because he's done nothing but sit in front of his computer his entire life, he knows a lot about wrestling history. He truly does. Can't take that away from him. And I felt that if... Done in the right way, he may be bearable on a podcast. I learned after I threw him off 605 how many people didn't listen to 605 expressly because he was on the show, including people in the fucking wrestling business who got in touch with me telling me how much they loved the show and they never gave it a chance before because he was on it. But I digress. You have digressed. I realized that Shoot Kick was going to take a considerable amount of time to put together. So I said, let's start doing something where we're just talking old school wrestling. Because again, this is what I think is missing from the wrestling podcast scene. So it becomes 6.05. We start it. Start episode one, Thanksgiving 2015. By episode three, I've got my sea legs. I realize I've got this. I think I could really run with this. I'm having fun with it. I think I could make this pretty big. I called you. And I said, would you come on 6.05? And you were surprised that I had a podcast because you and I had been friends for a long time. And usually when we got together in New York, we weren't talking about the idea that I would do something in wrestling. Well, you had not done anything in a, in an on camera role. You'd always been behind the scenes or an, an on microphone role in this case. Right. And in general, no matter what my business interest is, I like being behind the scenes. I like being behind the scenes. I get a lot of things done behind the scenes. You got the perfect face for being behind us. I'll go ahead. Well, anyway, I asked you to be on episode four and we had a great time. And you called me maybe a couple days after that episode was taped. And you said, Brian, I don't know if you've known this, but I've had some problems recently with my podcast. I need a new co-host. And I had a short list and it went from one to one. And I'd like you to be my co-host on my podcast. That is true. And I said, I would love to do that. I think we'd have a good time. However, I just started this show. I would want to make sure that there wouldn't be any complications or conflicts. You said you could do whatever you want with your show. You can plug your show every week on the air. That's where my 605 plug section came from. And I said, well, the other problem is I'm sure I can produce the show. And you were very insistent. You said, look, if Alice could produce the show, you can produce the show. <laughs> And I said, I'm sure I could. I just don't want that extra workload. How would you feel about me bringing a producer onto the show? And you said, well, if you think it'll work, you know, I'll trust you on it. Let's do that. And, and that's the only thing I've ever been mad at you about, Brian, last when you brought Styles Bitchley into my life. Well, I call up Yenta Bixenspan and I said, I just got off the phone with Jim Cornette and he cut me off right away and he goes, he wants me to be his co-host. <laughs> and I, I, I was taken aback. I laughed. I said, no, he wants me to be his co-host. And I'm thinking, I'm the one who's his friend. I'm the one who has the long relationship with him. I'm better on the air than you, even though you've been doing this for a while. In what world do you think he wants you to be the co-host? I, I, I heard that he has a wonderful voice for a producer. It should never be put on tape. Well, actually, what you may not remember is originally the plan was... And by the way, eventually he said yes. He was a little taken aback that you didn't want him to be the co-host, which, again, is stunning. <laughs> and he said yes. And I was trying to hook him up. I'm trying to do a solid for someone I'm doing something with and get him involved with a show that wasn't, at that point, making the money that I thought it could possibly make in the long run. And he said, the only problem is I don't want to have it known that I'm the producer. And I said, oh, that sucks, because your plan was well, it'd be great if he produces, because then we can make fun of his white boy voice on the air. <laughs> so originally, you did want him to like make appearances. That yeah, we can I, I, I thought, well, we can we can bring him on on like they do on the morning drive time radio shows. I hesitate to you know, draw comparisons to Howard Stern, but it's it, he didn't invent that. We could make him. We could make him somebody. We can make the boy somebody. They know who he is. Yes. But no, he says, no, let me say, because he remember, he said, I was on the phone for this one. Well, I just, I don't want my name mentioned because 
Cole Cabana pays me $75 a week to do something. I don't know what the fuck for his website. And well, I, no, I'm, no, 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 no. Cole Cabana was paying him to help him with a second podcast he had launched. And Bix has always denied this. And I will actually take him at his word for this. Who knows, though? But Cole Cabana launched a second podcast, which was remarkably similar to what Shoot Kick was going to be. <laughs> and he was paying Bix to work with him on that podcast. And Bix, even though he'd been friends with Cole Cabana for years, still went behind Cabana's back to work with you for the potential promise of more money. That says a lot about who Bix is. Yenta Bixen span. Well, I also heard somebody else say about him, said people that like him eventually won't. Yeah, no, <laughs> you, he, but, he falls out with everybody because everyone but, has and, the same experience with him. Basically, remember finally, Ed, but now if you stop me when if I tell a lie, was I ever rude to him or unkind to him in a legitimate mean way instead of a ribbing way on the phone? Or did I ever uh, do anything to him to make him feel unwelcome? Until finally we said, what the fuck? Will it, we can never get a recording schedule down because he's constantly got all these doctor's appointments for these horrifying mental and physical ailments that he comes up with. And you said, you know, I can pretty much record this thing myself now. And, and we, we told him his services were no longer required. You were never anything but nice to him, even helping him with articles he wrote. We were always nice from off air to the point where I knew you were getting frustrated because there was so many times we were about to record and he would go, oh, by the way, oh, anyway, and he would start yeah. gossiping about this and that and we couldn't start the recording and you, I, I can hear it in your voice when you get annoyed, you're like, okay, well, time is running out. You All know? right, we're burning daylight here, folks. Um, so, yeah, so that's true. And by the way, and this goes to my relationship with him. Actually, somebody else that he spoke to at the time called me up, and his opening line was, is, is Bix and Span a complete fucking idiot? That was the first time he'd ever spoken to the guy. So he makes a quick impression. He does. And I'm doing 605 with him while doing the cornet shows as well. And there were several problems which I found to be issues going forward with Bix, including but not limited to Bix diverting show money to his personal account without telling me about it. No! I was unaware of it. Malfeasance! And when I called him on it, he gave me the excuse, well, I need the money more than you. <laughs> I got news for you. He does, and he did. And that isn't the point. That isn't the point. If you're doing the show with someone, and they're your partner, and you're having an equal partnership, and you're doing something shady behind that person's back, and your excuse is, I need it more than you, fuck you. Seriously. Fuck. And then he later claimed he was joking, but whenever he gets called on something, he claims, I was a joke. It's just such high-level humor that it went over my head, I guess. Yeah, well, that's a, you, his punchlines usually land in a fucking muddy pit. There were many other issues, including threats from him to pull the show down. Threats from him not to edit the show, which was his only task after a while, because he sucked on the air. And he sucked the life out of the show. His task became recording it and producing it. And I got to the point, and I'll tell you exactly when this was. It was when I was in Hawaii. I thought about it, and I said, you know what? I love what I'm doing so much. I'm having so much fun with it. Why am I going to include someone with me who steals show money, threatens to take the show down, Tells me he has to pop Valium before we record because I stress him out too much. <laughs> so I told Yenta Bix, I said, this is done. This is done. If you decide you don't want to end the show, you can have the 605 Super Podcast. And I'll go create the Brian Last Super Podcast. And episode one's going to be, be me talking about all the various things you've done over the last several months and all the shit you've said about other people you work with. Over the last several months. Just basically telling him exactly what the fuck is wrong with him in no uncertain terms. Even after all of that. And I let him spin it on the air. I was a nice enough guy to let him spin it on the air that he was too busy with his fucking pseudo-journalism that he couldn't continue with 605. I let him spin it on the air. That's on me. But even after that, 
We still kept them around on the Jim Cornette shows. I still let him come back to 605 for special appearances because I realize he doesn't know any better. He has no fucking real world experience whatsoever. I'm not just saying like, oh, this is some guy I don't know. He doesn't have real world experience. I know the fucking guy. You said he's never driven a car. He's never held a real job. His life revolves around sitting in front of the computer and being on Twitter. Another wrestling podcaster pointed it out to me not too long ago. He's tweeted like over 200,000 times. <laughs> How is that even possible? I mean, wait a minute. Has he not got a fucking farm of Russian troll bots underneath that? He's doing it all himself? He is his own Russian troll farm. Well, so, but, but basically, we have given the people this history lesson here and this, this buildup and this character assassination. No, it's not this character of, assassination. Uh, have I said anything that wasn't true? You knew about everything. No, that no, no. You've, you've, you've assassinated him with truthful arrows. No, um, I didn't mean to say that you have assassinated his character. More like that you've put it, you've euthanized his character because it's all true. But here is what this, the, the fucking point is dipshit brings this on himself and i did it a little bit a few months ago when we talked about bitch the journalist because he was another one of these fucking morons out there trying to tell me how to modify my behavior and what i was doing was so bad and so wrong because it's one of these outlaw guys that he buddies up to and talks to and actually treats him like a human being so therefore he's on their side um and he wants to tell me what i need to do uh, coming from his position as a wrestling journalist, and I told him to go piss up a fucking rope and made fun of him because he's a fucking goof. But now... And he never bringing... let anyone know that he was producing the show for that time. He never well, no, he, he was he was, he was fine to work with both of us as long as we were talking to him and as long as he was uh, somehow figured into the thing, but then we become the world's worst people as soon as we don't want him around us anymore because he drags us the fuck down. And Lord knows watching wrestling, he does enough of that. But we didn't knock him. He started fucking running his pie hole about me. Then he started, and here is the, the ultimate thing. Wasn't even over anything important. This whole fucking thing that he's brought on himself and I'm sure now he's popping his fucking volumes and he's goddamn calling his goddamn psychiatrist and he's yelling upstairs to mommy, 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 they're talking mean about me again. Oh, God damn it. I don't know what to do. I, my, all my zits are going to pop. I'm so stressed. All this because he's got to jump in and say, well, it was just horrible the way they made fun of Jelly Nutella and Sonny Kiss and their tag team and they had all of their cult of cornet followers make up all those horrible disgusting names for the tag team of jelly nutella and sunny kiss because actually you know they say great minds think alike and i guess sooner or later all meth heads are fucking basement dwellers fucking coexist because apparently now old bitch is a fan of jellies so well, no, they're friends no no they're, they're not he's not a fan of him He's a friend to him. Oh, well, God, even worse. And you see, his thing is, the main thing he wants, other than money, and there's even more instances of him and money, he tried to get Tony Khan. He asked me for advice about how Tony Khan would give him money to build a website so he could do his reporting. He wanted Tony Khan, the guy who runs AEW, well, to buy him he, a website. Hey, he, he gave fucking Jelly Nutella a job as a wrestler, so why wouldn't he give some 325-pound fucking troll in the basement a goddamn website? He wants access. That's what it all comes down to. It comes down to access. Trust me, if Jelly Nutella stopped texting him back, he would go nuts on Jelly Nutella. We all saw this play out with his relationship with CM Punk many years ago. That's exactly what would happen. And well, no, but, but all I'm saying is he could have saved himself this ass chewing that he just got from both of us and being revealed to be a complete fucking backstabbing dipshit like everybody figures he is anyway, every time they hear him speak, if he just hadn't have bothered to go into how that all the cult of Cornette members were horrible for making up funny names about his friend Jelly and his friend Sonny and then bring you into it and say, well, he just. He's spoiled. What did he call? It? He said. He said you're spoiled and you, and you fart elderberries. Yeah, what did right, he say? Right. By the way, you're right. I am spoiled. 
I busted my ass throughout my 20s and my early 30s to make as much money as possible so that by the time I was the age of 40, I could do whatever the fuck I wanted. I spoiled myself, you little shit. (laughs) Sorry that I wasn't sitting on the couch waiting for mommy to drive me to the doctor's appointment. Like you. You, you know, you never, little you noob. motherfucker, you never told me he couldn't drive himself 35 years old or whatever it is, and he never drove himself. What? You never told me that. Yeah, and it's one thing if you live in an urban setting. I got friends who like, grew up in Manhattan who never got a yeah, driver's license. don't have a car, That's right? different. That's different. We grew up in suburbia. We're from the same hometown, Long Beach, New York. He just can't, he can't get to the doctor, but all of this could have been saved. I, I remind everyone once again, if he just had, didn't have to fucking say that me and you were horrible because we all together came up with funny names for his friend, Jelly and Sonny's tag team, such as peanut butter and jelly. Pretty shitty. All right. <laughs> Too cold sodomy. See, that's the, you're going Nut too far. Nut butter man. and jelly. The Shart Foundation was popular. I will say that. The Shart Foundation, the Cornhole Express, <laughs> Smucker Up and Kiss, The Unwatchables, <laughs> your favorite, Technicolor Yawn. That one is good. <laughs> you see Greasy one? and cheesy. And by the way, the, I mean, here's the hi- hypocrisy of the whole thing. Or not even, this is just the way he behaves. Because so, a bunch of people, that's how I woke up today, was people sending me this. Look what he said overnight on Twitter. You know, we're all blocked, so we can't see this. He's just well, you know, he, he doesn't even block individual people. He's got like a private gimmick, right? So he can say shit, but unless he specifically sends it to you, you don't know he's oh, saying it. I don't know about that. I, I just thought I we're know. all blocked. But Well, he, he blocks real good. And oh, there's... And wait a minute. Meth and makeup. Okay, we, will you stop it? No, no, no. Bound for glory holes. <laughs> The Talent Twins, Slim and Nun, Cirque du Soleil, and some guy. That time of the month, Nuts and Ass. You just had these on your desk. Fancy <laughs> and Flabby. The How Do These Guys Have a Job Squad? And also a couple of new ones that have come in from the home office in Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh, no. Jelly No Nuts. <laughs> what? And... The shoddy Donnas. The shoddy Donnas, ladies and gentlemen. That, that's so, all right. That's all right. All right. So, uh, uh, but bitch, you know what we think of you. And anytime you decide you want to open your pie hole and tell us that we need to modify our behavior in any way, we will We will obviously tell people, again, more of what we think of you because you're a piece of shit. Yeah, and don't come after Thank me, you little sir. shit. Don't come after me. I know who the fuck you are. I've Good been day. to your fucking house. I've seen your fucking face. I used to drop off videos for him to dub copies because I felt bad for the kid. I used to let him borrow videos. Wait a minute. But now you've made me, you've, you've baby faced yourself again. You've made me feel bad for you with the line. I've seen your fucking face. Well, no, but listen to this because I used to lend him videos so he could dub copies and give them back to me. I figured, okay, I'm helping a wrestling fan. I always said anything you do with this, I wanted to say it's coming from the Brian Last collection. Never did that. It was just from the Bix collection. But anyway, I used to go there on the way to the gym when I was living in Long Beach. And this is years ago. This is probably 2005 or so. I had a girlfriend with me in the car. And we're driving to the gym. I would pull up in front of his house. He would waddle out to the fucking car. He wore the same Super Mario Brothers t-shirt for like three fucking years every time I went there. And he comes to the car. I got the sunroof open. I'm in a sedan. I got the. I was probably in the Jaguar at the time. I'm, I got the sunroof open. The windows are all open. I like to drive fast and have the windows open and get a breeze. All right. He's leaning over the car to talk to me. Drool. Drool. <laughs> Not spit, but drool comes off his fucking mouth. Went on my girlfriend's hand. As soon as it got oh, there, no. she went off on me. Don't you ever bring me back to that fucking guy's house ever again. I got to admit, it was disgusting. He drooled on her. Drool. Literal drool. Did he acknowledge the drooling no. and, and apologize for it? No, he did not acknowledge he just, it. He just let it drop from his mouth to her person and kept continuing on. He was too busy talking to me about wrestling videos he wanted. He didn't acknowledge that. And I never, ever brought her back to the house to drop off tapes. I didn't even go in the house at that point. I, I was, was about to say, I, did you take her back to her house? Did she ever let you in her house again? <laughs> And no, we I've were seen you with a couple of girls people would drool over, but that's ridiculous. No, but it wasn't like he was. Let me clarify. He wasn't drooling over the girl. 
He was drooling over the girl. It was general drool. It was uncontrollable. But he was drooling drool. over the top of her. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so he was actually drooling over the girl. I, it's it's it can be literal and, and figurative. I and guess. and I've never heard of it literally before. Seriously, when you go out there and you try to point your finger at everyone, it's not just you. And this time it's not just me. It's anyone in wrestling. You know, this person's horrible. This person did this. We should all get this person. I said it. His moves are, he runs to the nearest balcony, stirs the pot. If that doesn't work, tries to stir it a little more, get more attention. When everyone says you're acting like an idiot, he says it's a joke. When everyone says it clearly wasn't a joke, he makes himself the victim. Happens time after time after time. Meanwhile, he's the biggest fucking hypocrite ever. I would never do anything with David. I'm not going to say his real name. I would never do anything <laughs> with Bixen Span, Yenta Bixen Span, that involved money. Because he's proven to me time and time again he's compromised and compromisable. I didn't even, there are more stories I'm not even going to fucking go into right now. There's more? No. There's right. more stories. But he points his fingers at everyone. He accuses everyone of everything. How many times did he tell me, oh, Chris Jericho is a cocaine problem. Just look at his nose. The fuck? Look at his nose. What does that tell you? <laughs> I know plenty of people that do coke. Their nose isn't any different than it was before they did coke. Remember the Saturday Night Live sketch? Where I think it was Chevy Chase had a joint and he fucking yes. wrapped the goddamn arm. rubber band around his arm and he tried to fucking inject the joint into his vein and they said, see why they call it dope? Ah, no real see? world experience and I've always treated him with kid gloves. I've always felt bad for him. I've never hit him hard even after he's done stupid thing after stupid thing and run his mouth time after time after time. But enough is enough. There's unfortunately still some people out there who think he has any credibility whatsoever. He doesn't. I think you're exaggerating. I don't think anyone thinks that he has credibility. Seriously. And if you really piss me off, I'll start dropping the neutron bomb. <laughs> so don't piss me off. But anyway, back to the show. I'm just doing it, doing a neutron dance. I'm just doing it, do it. You know what? Here's another thing. If you don't want to wear the same Super Mario Brothers shirt for fucking three years. If you want to be comfortable and stylish at the same time, folks, our friends at Buttercloth can fix you up. <laughs> Buttercloth is the world's most comfortable dress shirt. It feels like you're wearing a T-shirt. Whether you're tall, short, portly and husky or thin, a range of sizes to perfectly fit your body type, not stiff and scratchy. They call it profoundly soft fabric. It's 100% long fiber cotton, a unique manufacturing process, six-way stretch. It'll give every... If you can bend that way, it will fucking stretch that way, folks. You've seen it on Shark Tank. Now they've got their new icy cotton collection, woven with organic mint fibers for the natural cooling effect you can still stay cool in the summertime. We still got some summer left, folks. Long fiber cotton, breathable, long sleeve, short sleeve, regular, tall. Folks, just go to Buttercloth, B-U-T-T-E-R, because it's soft as butter. Buttercloth.com slash J-C-E and get 20% off your first full price order. These things are classic shirts and they're worth some money and you will save some money as well. Buttercloth.com slash jce 20 percent off your first purchase I, I, I brian you sit around wearing these things of course i actually sit around my office often completely naked but you sit around wearing these comfortable buttercloth shirts that mint cooling one is one of the best shirts i've ever owned my entire life i love it so much i regularly argue with suzanne about when she can wash it because i don't want to take it off i may wear it for three years straight you never know <laughs> well but you can't you can't shave the scraggly pubic hair off your face in that time. If you're going to go go with it, go all the way. Anyway, buttercloth. Um, okay, and let's get the programming schedule. Have you vented enough, by the way? Just, you're turning into me. No, I, look, it took a lot to get me to this point, and I'm still not saying everything. And I feel bad about the fact I have to do this, but enough is enough. How many fucking veiled shots do you get to take? All right, I didn't mean to start anything back up. I'm just... Fucking little weasel when I know what a fucking weasel you are. <laughs> Seriously, I'm an adult in the grown-up world. Weasel. You're in your mid-30s and you behave like a 12-year-old. Stay in your fucking lane. 
Uh, hold anyway. On, hold on. Back to the arts. Uh, there we go. <laughs> now we're back to normal. All righty. This week's coming up. I don't even know. We usually record the drive through on the day we're recording experience. My birthday. Maybe I am getting old. I'm getting the, as they call it, the old timers disease, not Alzheimer's, old timers. So I can't remember what day or show we're even doing here. But this week's drive through will be out Wednesday, not Monday, but Wednesday. And we, yes, we will have the previously advertised Hulk Hogan versus The Rock WrestleMania 18 watch along. And we are also, hopefully as another a, a palate cleanser for some of the current stuff that we like to do on the drive throughs we like the, the drive through to be a palate cleanser, an uplifting, a positive show. Uh, we are going to watch and discuss the new Ring of Honor restart, the pure championship, your pure title, pure wrestling title tournament that a bunch of people in and out of the business have tweeted and have emailed me about saying that this is something that we should see. And I must admit, I have not seen any ring of honor for a long time. Uh, I, I did every once in a while peek at it in the days and weeks and months after I left their full-time employee. But when they were taken over by the band of fucking Keebler elves and pixies that populated the company for a while. I just, I did not choose to watch any of it. So this will be interesting, but I've been, I've been told good things and that's why we want to take a look at it. And hopefully something positive can come from this. So we're going to do that on the, on the drive through Hogan and rock and the ring of honor restart. If now anyone has new new programs again, if anyone has a copy of it, they could send me uh, through legal means. Please uh, yes. send me a link because I don't I don't think I have this on my TV here. So I need to find a way to see. Oh, you episode. sound so Markish. I don't think I have this on my TV here. No, I mean I've never it's seen the a Sinclair. programming is not available in your area. Is what you're trying to oh, say? Oh no, yeah, that sounds much better. Yes, it does. Well, and actually, there's no Sinclair station in Louisville, but it's on here locally. Ring of Honor on one of the smaller station shall we say but nevertheless anyway is it on an hd um where you where you are i didn't pay any goddamn attention because i haven't actually fucking watched it yet i've just been been uh, uh, i've seen it on the listings for one of the local stations but i have not watched it but i'm going to watch it because it's on here several times a fucking weekend as i've seen in between cooking shows. I don't know what to fucking tell you. All right, I'll see what we could do. Anyway, also, keeping with programming, um, uh, then our uh, the experience will come out this Friday as normal, so we're catching up slowly but surely, right? Don't call you Shirley. Uh, experience will come out as normal this week, and then next week, the drive through will escape the afternoon of Tuesday, September 29th. Correct. And the and that week the experience will be as normal as well, and 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 there you got it. And then after that, hopefully back to the Monday Friday schedule. You got it. And in and as a matter of fact, and for the people who were saying, "Oh God, what are we going to do?" The experience delayed another day. Well, there goes my Sunday, or there goes my whatever. What if you just can't get enough? If you just cannot get enough of us, Patreon and YouTube. Tell them all about it, Brian. Patreon.com slash Cornette for only $5 a month to get access to the archives. Every single episode of the drive through and the experience from the beginning in November of 2013. Right now we have shows up to the early summer of 2015 with another batch of shows going up each and every Sunday night. Patreon.com slash Cornette. And of course the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel tinyurl.com slash official corny YouTube, or just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. You get to hear full episodes, clips of episodes, as well as omnibus collections with the very popular Travis Heckle artwork, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. And uh, subscribe now. That's Your right. Your life depends on it. We are approaching 165,000 subscribers on our March to a Million. Be one of them today. Okay, I got an email, and I, I realize this show has been a lot of us 
bitching about people, bitching about bitches. So in the, I want to change the tone. I want to let somebody else bitch about people. No, um, but this is a very interesting observation by a member of the cult of Cornette, John, who writes, Hello, Jim. I was just listening to your recent comments about the young bucks acting all edgy and being in a dark place, super kicking everybody because they are sad. And I had a realization. I think the best comparison for these new darker and edgier young bucks is comparing their current behavior to Professor Chaos attempts at evil in South Park. But unlike Professor Chaos, both the AEW roster and its audience are supposed to take the Bucks' attempts at being mad and edgy completely serious, or serial. Like you, Mr. Cornette, I just cannot take two grown men who look like middle school children seriously. I'm going to debate you on the grown men part, John. Especially when they're clearly having temper tantrums. I think Professor Chaos is a perfect analogy for the current Young Bucks, and I'd love to hear if you agree or disagree. Also, happy birthday. I don't, what do you think, Brian? Who is, who is more evil and sinister and strikes more fear in the hearts of people, the edgy and dark place Young Bucks or Butters Stotch in his alter ego of Professor Chaos? There's a few things to say. One is, I think the Bucks are better as heels, although the way it's being done is a bit silly. Secondly, because I'm not a South Park aficionado, I'm not fully aware of Professor Chaos. Oh, come on. You have not even, you've never actually followed the attempts of Professor Chaos to strike fear into the hearts of all of the citizens of South Park by creating chaos, such as, as going into a restaurant and ordering things and then walking out or, or, or what? <laughs> making prank phone calls. I mean, he literally, uh, anarchy rules in South Park whenever Professor Chaos is around. So when we did this segment a few episodes ago and you started saying Super Serial, this is where it's from? It's Well, this is also from another episode of South Park. Okay. Because that's when, when Al Gore had to be convinced to come in and help the citizens of South Park <laughs> by the boys because they were being, uh, uh, they were being uh, persecuted and, and terrorized by Man Bear Pig. And Al Gore had been the only one to warn us years ago that Man Bear Pig was real and was coming. Now that it was here, nobody believed him. So he had to be apologized to and talked politely to come and help in the Man Bear Pig threat because he had always been super serial about Man Bear Pig. Here's the question. John, I, I propose this theory to you. Could either of the Young Bucks actually whip Butters in a fight? And I don't know whether I would uh, uh, compare Professor Chaos to the Young Bucks in their current incarnation now, because Professor Chaos is somewhat entertaining. I think we could possibly draw a better comparison to the Young Bucks and the Coon, because the Coon was not only a totally ineffectual superhero, but one that nobody cared was around, didn't really pay any attention to, and got his thunder stolen by another kid, Craig, who was doing his own superhero bit. So I think the Coon. Did you ever see the Coon trilogy, Brian? I have no idea what you're talking about. Cartman was the Coon. He had raccoon claws and a raccoon mask. <laughs> and he was... <laughs> He was the coon and he would he would he would just scratch you with those fingernails or with those raccoon nails as his superpower. But nobody liked the coon. What about wacky races? Can we turn this show into wacky races, you think? I think that could work. Could, could maybe Brody Lee could be Dick Dastardly and they they that they could finally find a place for the fucking dwarf. Stunt. He could be Muttley. He's the same size. Did you like the cannonball run? Cannonball, but that was live action. Yeah, but in the you know in the uh, milieu of wacky races. Well, yeah, but I, uh, wacky races that uh, they're not serious enough to be Cannonball Run. We've got to have something around here. I think they should do, especially after the parking lot fight that we'll talk about later on. They should get all those cars and do wacky races, and and this could get greenlit right away because Brandy could be Penelope Pitstop. 
So right there, as long as there's a spot for Brandy, we can get that going. What were you going to ask me? What was Dom DeLuise's character in Cannonball Run? Was it Captain Chaos? Something like the S, yes. <laughs> there's a lot of chaos going around. Uh, but yeah, I think that even more than, than South Park, I think that, that there could be an AEW wacky races. You put all those fucking guys in a bunch of the cars they had in the, out in the parking lot and just send them across the fucking country. And whoever gets to San Diego first or Amarillo by morning or whatever wins the, the wacky races. You want to bet on it, Brian? I see where you're going. Could we bet on it? Could we bet who's going to win the AEW wacky races? I wonder if my bookie will help us out. Because after all, if you want to bet on something, you naturally go to my bookie. And winning season has returned at my bookie. That means doubling your first deposit. Folks, you can sit up with your feet cropped up on cropped up or propped up either one on the couch, and you can win these insane props, these epic bonuses. The craziest cross sport wagers, watch the live sports and bet the live sports all season long. The NFL has returned action packed Sundays, huge cash prizes. You all can get in on the action that me and Brian last have no idea about because we don't know how this shit works. But folks, if you go to mybookie.ag and use the promo code JCE, you can double your first deposit. New players get up to a thousand dollars in free play. It's designed to add more excitement to the sports you love and the games you bet. So you can bet with the best this NFL season for your chance to win big. Everybody's winning but us, Brian, because we don't know how to do this shit. But go to mybookie.ag, use the promo code JCE, double your first deposit, and as a thank you, send me and Brian a small percentage of your winnings. That's right. I didn't know we, I didn't know we were encouraging... <laughs> Money to be sent in, soupy sales. Yes, sin. <laughs> Look, everybody out there listening to me now, go to your mother and father's, your mother's purse or your father's wallet. There's some green paper inside. Get all the green paper, put it in an envelope, and send it to Brian Last, P.O. Box 2, Parsippany, New Jersey, 60609. There we go. You know, it, it, he got kicked it, off TV for doing that. Well, I was about, I was actually, <laughs> I was present when a, a morning team in Charlotte had their soupy sales moment. Oh, I don't know about this. I, um, I won't even mention their names. Maybe they've, they've, you know, covered up this part of their history, but I used to do a lot of morning radio in Charlotte. My friend, Cat Collins was on one of the stations there for a while. I, I did some shows with him. I filled in mornings one week when their regular morning team was on vacation and we'd go in and we'd do, um, you know, I would do promos for the matches or whatever, just cause they, they loved the wrestlers in Charlotte. They always wanted the guys on radio, whatever. And they liked the radio. People liked me being on radio. I had the perfect face for it. So I'm in there one day doing a morning show. And it was his guy and his girl, and they announced th there was a competing a competing rock station that had a contest going on that if you were called in and did something or answered such and such question, you know, then you would win a brand new car. That was their competition station owned by another group, not their call letters, not even in their building, a completely other station. So we're in the studio and in between fucking bits, they're playing a record and somebody calls, Hey, am I the 14th caller to answer? It's, it's, you know, here's the answer to the question or whatever. And they said, well, great. You just want a brand new car. Go down there and pick it up. <laughs> and they hung up and thought, what a fucking sucker. He called the wrong radio station. The guy went to the car lot <laughs> demanding his fucking brand new car. And they said, what the fuck? And the car lot complained to the radio station and the radio station that was really running the contest, uh, their management complained to the radio station where the guys just asked off and they got them fired oh, wow. for giving away the, the fucking uh, uh, DJs got fired for telling the guy he'd won a car when he called the wrong radio station. You never know what can happen. That's why we do all of our own programming and we have no producer because nobody can yank us off the air. Bye, Cracky. 
You going to take that out? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> what am I daring somebody to do? <laughs> All right. All right. Enough of these shenanigans and tomfoolery. What are you doing this week on your various programs where you make a supplemental living? Of course, you, you can get more information about the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few items here. First thing uh, I want to say here at the top, someone who has been a guest on 605, someone who has been a good friend, one of the real good guys out there in professional wrestling, Jim Valley, is going through a bit of a battle right now, and he's in the hospital. He's been on and off ventilators. I believe now he's currently not on a ventilator, but Hopefully he hears this. I've texted him a few times, but I hope Jim Valley feels better, gets better. A lot of people miss his voice, and a lot of people just really want him to be healthy. I don't know if you know him well, Jim, but he's really I, one, one of the good guys out there. I've met him in Charlotte a few years ago, and yes, I've heard nothing but good stuff, so get well, Jim. Get well, Jim Valley. Also, we'll have more information about a big, uh, some big Arcadian Vanguard news in the next few weeks, but this week, want to make mention of Ron Fuller's Super Stud Cast. We talked about it last time. The tribute to Bob Armstrong over four hours of the Tennessee Stud talking with the legends of wrestling about Bullet Bob as well as audio from the last ever interview Bullet Bob Armstrong did about his career. Part one is up right now. Patreon.com slash studcast. Part one has Jim Cornette, Jerry Briscoe, Terry Funk, and Stan Hansen. All legends. Check it out today. Patreon.com slash studcast. Also want to make mention of the latest episode of John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, then and now. This, of course, is the show where John and myself go back and review the original broadcasts of John's landmark wrestling radio show, Pro Wrestling Spotlight. We are now in July of 1990. John is just back from Baltimore. The Great American Bash tonight that's... Took, it took him a while. It it's it only took, a couple of hundred miles. It took him 30 years? Well, 30 years ago, John was in Baltimore for the Bash, Sting finally winning the world championship from Ric Flair, and then he came back the next day on the air, and he had Steve Beverly, who at that point was the publisher of Matt Watch and also on the WCW Hotline, as well as Joe Pettacino, who had just left what would become WCW, the NWA. Jim, I actually have a few audio clips I pulled. I wanted to play you. I wanted to get your thoughts on what they were saying in that moment in 1990, but also what you think this audio says about wrestling nowadays, how this could be applied to wrestling in 2020, what they said in 1990. Can I play you a couple clips? Yeah, yes, and also, and we talked about it a couple weeks ago on one of these shows in that this was probably the era when newsletter editors had more input with a major promotion than any other probably still to this day because heard once he got in there and realized he was lost he didn't trust any of the wrestling people that already worked there to not be out for themselves and and he couldn't tell the difference one from another what they were telling him so he was talking to Steve Beverly because he Steve Beverly had a a background in television and TV news and journalism. And he, but he also was a wrestling fan that, that published Matt watch and Joe Petticino had worked in television ad sales and, and radio and, and, and commercial sales of broadcasting, etc. And then, you know, of course he talked to Meltzer. So a lot of these guys ended up with jobs and, and I like all of the people that we've just mentioned and in some cases, they were very perceptive. In other cases, maybe it was too much fan opinion, which as we've seen, when fan opinion goes unchecked with wrestling experience, that can go completely down the wrong road in a different direction. So, But like you said, Steve Beverly was doing something on the hotline. He was also publishing his independent newsletter. He was on the phone with Hurt a lot. But it, it, and, and Pettacino had just left WCW. Um, the Joe Pettacino nose and fan man segment. I think Joe rubbed a few people the wrong way in the wrestling uh, contingent because he came in 
giving himself a little bit too much credit for being in wrestling and because he hosted the superstar show in Atlanta, a lot of those guys in WCW did not necessarily look at Joe Pettacino as an experienced wrestling veteran. So sometimes Heard would take their opinions and he should, sometimes he should, and he wouldn't. And it just, but, but anyway, play the clips. It's interesting to, to hear what they're saying 30 years later. I'm going to play clip one and then we'll talk about that and I'll play clip two, but here's clip one. Putting it this way too, Joe, and I think most fans, see the, the fact is, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of the people who are in creative positions in professional wrestling organizations are people who have been at it so long that oftentimes they haven't stopped to smell the roses somewhat, hate to use a cliche. But they haven't really stopped to realize that fans have gotten pretty sophisticated today. This isn't your old toothless wonder audience out there watching professional wrestling. Uh, people have become pretty shrewd to the fact that titles don't usually change hands unless it's something where cameras are rolling, and more often than not, only when it is a pay-per-view. Uh, I think people are pretty shrewd to that, and I think more than anything else, that's one reason that arena crowds are down all over the country, and for the, for that fact, there's nothing that Sting can do about that as far as drawing crowds. But my own opinion is, when you come to a situation of this old mentality, well, let's turn a bunch of people so that we can get some fresh heat there. Turns have been done in the last six years with all of the national exposure professional wrestling turns have been done so often they are no longer special they happen too many times lex luger has gone back in two now since he started professional wrestling and he's only been a pro about four and a half years now he's gone back in two on the spectrum three different times already there's no credibility there to turning somebody when you've done it that often uh, the same thing goes for, that's one of the reasons I think that the Ric Flair going back to a heel again has not been an extraordinary draw because he, he was just a baby face a short time ago. He was just, he was a fan favorite. And in my opinion, that from, from that standpoint, you can't expect the audience to sit there and have any credibility with this after a while. Uh, it, it, there's nothing special to it. It's just like uh, seeing eight guys. One of, the, one of the things that I got bothered about leading up to the Flair Sting matchup was on some of the NWA syndicated shows almost every week. It would end up with all dudes with attitudes and all horsemen in an eight-man brawl. That used to be something that was so very special because you'd see it very rarely. They'd get into it maybe once every four, five, six months. They were doing it every week. It's no longer special to the audience. And so you don't get the intensity, and then they wonder why. Right. Well, there's clip one, Jim. What are your thoughts <laughs> on what Steve Beverly was saying there? Well, there's a lot in there to unpack, as they say. Um, he hit... One of the nails on the head is that at the arenas, the arenas weren't drawing, but not be, not only because there were no title changes. Yes, people had gotten smart to that, that it seemed like the title only changed hands um, on pay-per-view or at the big event, which could have easily been rectified by just switching something. And 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 sometimes they'd do it with the tag team titles on, on uh, house shows or whatever. But also that that partially uh, uh, veils the fact that the arenas weren't drawing in bigger part because there was rotten local promotion, rotten arena booking and scheduling, uh, going to the wrong places <laughs> because they would go to places like uh, Carbondale, Illinois, where there's a, a college that had a big college arena. They went there in the middle of summer when nobody was in in school. Um, it, it was a new group that had taken over and they didn't know what towns to run and they wouldn't listen to the people that had been booking them for years. So instead, they just went off on their own and thought, we'll just do like Vince. And they ended up in Seattle and wherever the fuck. So that did hurt the arenas even more than no title changes. Where he said the old mentality, well, let's turn a bunch of people. That's not an old mentality. That's a desperate mentality. Um, and a lot of it came from too many booking teams and heads, because if this was the summer of 1990, as we've talked about on the program, in the previous nine months, they'd gone from Dusty Rhodes to Jimmy Crockett to George Scott to a committee to, well, the past year and a half, I should say. 
Yeah. Um, in the previous 18 months, God, think about this now. Previous 18 months, Dusty Rhodes, Jimmy Crockett, George Scott, Booking Committee, Ric Flair, another committee, Ole Anderson. So every time somebody else was in charge, they would turn somebody or they'd change somebody or they'd dump somebody, they'd bring somebody in. There was no continuity whatsoever. That's not an old mentality, even in a territory where the same booker had had control. When you turned a bunch of guys at the same time, that was desperate. That was trying to be hot shot and find anything that worked. This was too many turns from too many booking teams and heads because nobody could last or coexist with with herd um he's definitely right on with the big eight-man brawls weren't special anymore because now look 30 years later the guy to, well the those big sledgehammer shots to the head and fucking uh you know uh, explosions aren't as rare as they used to be much less an eight-man an eight-man brawl opens the program they come up on the air there's eight people fighting Shitstain took care of that a few years after this. So yes, bingo. And it's just, it, when you make anything less special, you know, it, it's, it's not going to get over. So what do you think about his see, points about flair, about flair turning back heel after he had just been babyface? And again, you're talking about quick turns, turn babyface in what may of 89. He's back heel at the beginning of 1990. Do you think that hurt the houses? no, because Flair was more comfortable in that position. Flair was more effective in that position. He had to be a baby face, the thing with funk. But once that was over with, and they were trying to reestablish the horseman and put Sting as the top baby face in that spot, he had to turn back. And it, 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 it was a good turn. But not, that's what we've talked about before. Nothing was going to draw in this environment because the company running the wrestling operation was fucked up at the head and the, and, and it wasn't going to, no matter what they did, even when they got ratings, couldn't translate into selling tickets because everything else was screwed up too. But the, the one thing there is when I talked about the newsletters and uh, they were wrestling fans, Beverly and Petticino and those guys, they were fans. They knew who they wanted to see. They knew they wanted to see different guys. They just didn't have the experience of actually doing it to know how to get new different guys over. That's that's where the disconnect came. If they both could have talked to each other, instead of Ole coming in and immediately going back to the fucking JYD and whatever, or George Scott coming in and assigning the Iron Sheik, they could have gotten new guys that were hot, that hadn't been seen, but they were hot amongst the newsletter readers because they had something, Brian Pillman, etc., and they could have pushed those guys as hard as they did the over the hill gang. But the most of the people booking at the time, Flair was an exception. He tried to get Pillman over. He tried to get young guys over. Most of the booking teams, George Scott, Ole Anderson, the committees had gone back to, and Heard would take advice from Barnett. Who do you think Barnett's pulling for? Barnett's the one that booked Mil Mascaris in fucking Corpus Christi in 1990 to draw the Mexicans. <laughs> So the uh, the people with wrestling experience were picking the wrong talent and the newsletter re uh, editors and people from outside the business that had input oftentimes picked the right talent but didn't know how to get them over. So you got another clip. You know, I've, I do, I've I do, talked enough. Before I get there, Dave Meltzer and Steve Beverly both on previous episodes to this talked about, and I want to know if you were there, if you remember this, when Ole took over as the booker, there was a locker room meeting and Ole said, forget everything you know, we're going back to 1974. Did that really happen? Well, I don't, I remember that being reported, but here's the thing. At that time he was booking us so seldom we were probably off. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Cause he pulled you uh, off TV as a commentator. Yes. Well, he wouldn't book the midnight on television at all. Cause Heard didn't like him and he didn't want to die on that hill. So I'd oftentimes, cause they were doing a lot of the syndicated TV in Gainesville, Georgia. I would get up at 10 o'clock in the morning or not get up, but leave at 10 o'clock in the morning, drive three and a half hours to Gainesville, do a two minute interview segment, the Louisville slugger that was formatted into one of the syndicated shows. I'd be out of the building by four o'clock and home at, back in Charlotte by the time that they rang the bell to start the taping. So I didn't hear a lot of that shit. I don't know. 
It sounds like Oli would say something like that, a provocative, uh, exclamatory statement, and then explain it with, because you fucking guys have gone too far and we need to gear this back and we need to concentrate on getting guys over and making shit mean something. And he would have said a bunch of shit after that that you would agree on and agree with. But the problem was, as I said, he was picking the wrong guys because he was still stuck in the fact that those guys had drawn money for him in the past, but he didn't realize how long it had been. And I mean, it wasn't bad to have Stan Hansen for a bit, even at, you know, at that point in time. Uh, but also you got, you know, uh, other guys that couldn't still go anymore. And uh, that's, that was the issue is, is, picking the wrong talent, pushing them the right way instead of picking the right talent, pushing them the wrong way. That's, that's all they were doing at that time period, depending on who got the goddamn book or the power. Well, that kind of sets up clip two. Here's Joe Pettacino and Steve Beverly talking to John Arezzi about what do you do with Sting? Now that he's been elevated, now that he's the world champion, how do you book him? Let me play this and get your thoughts on the other side. You know, and, and when I'm in a dressing room and I hear somebody say, well, I don't understand it. The audience, you boy, when we used to do that, it really popped an audience. And the audience really used to go, go wild and, and they didn't even react. And it just, I get a kick out of it because it's staring them right in the face. You know, what they, you know, I can't believe that somebody would sit there and say, well, you know, you used to give them something like that. They used to see it once every two or three months. And now they see it every week. Why would they, why would they get excited? As a matter of fact, the NWA, unfortunately, got to the point it was so bad that the fans expected it to happen and got upset if it didn't. And you're not going to draw an audience if they think you're going to have a brawl and you don't. Uh, you know, if they're expecting it and you don't have one, whether you have it or not, it's not going to help you draw. And it, st it stares them right in the face, uh, you know, and it just, it, it, Steve and I have talked about this many times. How, how often do you see Hulk Hogan wrestle on television? It is a rare occasion. They have made it into a very rare occasion for you to see Hulk Hogan wrestle. Hey, it's, Joe, it's, if, if I can draw a parallel here, it's, it's just like when Elvis Presley's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, took him off of television completely in the, in the late 50s until 1968 when he did his big comeback special. Elvis Presley was off television for eight solid years, did not make an appearance. If you had to see Elvis, you got had to pay money to go to the movies, or you had to go see him uh, in a nightclub yep. or at a concert. It's the same concept here with Hulk Hogan. And yet Ric Flair wrestles uh, unknown opponents, uh, you know, almost every two or three weeks all over their television, or he's involved in a tag match or something. It was no big deal to see Ric Flair wrestle. I hope the NWA is smart enough to take a look and, and, and realize something. When we talk about looking at the WWF, we're not saying that they're great and that they do everything right, but they do. They have proven over the past five years one thing. No matter what you think of them, they have proven they are a premier marketing company for entertainment. And take a hint from, from them and from Colonel Parker and all the other people that are in the entertainment business. Don't give them your top attraction all over the place. Don't put Sting on TV on a regular basis. Have him on all the shows doing interviews. Have him out there doing uh, you know, special features on him and stuff like that. Build him into a star. But for goodness sakes, don't let the fans see him in there wrestling against a uh, um, Barry Horowitz or somebody like that on a regular basis. Because if you do... He's deluded. That's right. It's not that big a deal to go out and pay to see him, uh, you know, wrestle. They've got to understand something. People nowadays go to see stars. They don't. The truth of the matter is, an awful lot of the people who go to wrestling matches today, the match itself is not the important part. It's seeing the star. If I can see Sting every week on TV, then I have to sort of think about it if I'm going to spend forty to sixty bucks to take my family to see him in person. There has to be a mystique there. When it's your biggest star in your promotion, there has to be a mystique. And, and the smartest thing they could do right now is to pull Sting completely.
completely off of television except for interviews or for uh, participation in various things on, on the programs. But the only time he ought to be wrestling where TV viewers can see him should be on pay-per-view shows and maybe in one or two clashes a year, but not. I wouldn't even put him on every clash. No. Oh, good Lord. All right, what do you think of that, John? Oh, good Lord. Well, here's the problem again. <laughs> with people outside the business. Everything they just said was true about Hulk Hogan because the thing with Hulk Hogan, how, the, how they were able to smash Hulkamania over was because look at him. He looks the part already and he can talk his ass off. And the less you saw him wrestle, the more you wanted to see him wrestle, not just because of the... The the correctness of they said you create a mystique and, and it's more special, but also because the more that you saw Hulk Hogan wrestle, the more you had seen Hulk Hogan wrestle. That was the weakest part of his game. The marketing and merchandising was all about the tease of getting to see Hulk Hogan wrestle and he could talk you in and he looked the part to begin with. Sting looked great. But looks work promo, the promo would probably, everybody would have picked in third place. And Sting, at that point, was still not an iconic personality that Hogan had become. Point I'm making is it works with some people, it doesn't work with others. If you didn't have, with some guys who are the workers or the athletes, it gets them over more to see them wrestle more often. Flair. Once he got over as a top star and started becoming the world champion, he loved to work on TV, even against, uh, you know, George South or Barry Horowitz or whoever, you know, uh, great workers, but guys had never won because he liked to show what he could do. And, and I don't know that I would have booked him as many times as they did with underneath guys once he established his status, but Flair was not only a ratings draw, but Flair was so good in the ring that it made your program and your promotion look so much better to have that guy in a match on your show. Book him with other top guys. Book him in main events. Book him in non-title matches. Don't give the world title match with his top contender away for free. But there, with some guys that, that get over better in the ring, it's better to see him wrestle and hear him talk a little bit and build it that way. Sometimes guys who are Sid was another guy. You want to see him, you want to hear him talk, but you don't want to watch him wrestle very often. Make him pay to see that. It's called stealing a fucking house. When you've, when you, uh, the magnificent Zulu, when you got a guy that looks the part and you can build around him, uh, you don't want the people to see him any more often than not, because they'll see through him. You want them to pay for it. It's different with every talent. To hold Sting back to only a pay-per-view at a couple clashes a year would have been ludicrous. Because especially the NWA and WCW was built on guys in the ring doing a, a Mid-South wrestling type of TV taping where you had main event matches, but the finishes led to more main events. Uh, Vince was always... A simpler philosophy. They didn't do complicated finishes. They didn't do heat finishes to come back and build returns. They sold the sizzle, not the steak. And he got it from the way they treated Bruno. Bruno never wrestled on television in the days when there were never main events on TV. Because he was the world champion. The world champion is the last one that would wrestle on free TV. Just like when Muhammad Ali wouldn't fight for free on fucking Wide World of Sports. But Bruno could talk him in and he was over. And it was before the days where people expected main event matches on television. So that they got that in large part from the way the world champion had always been treated, but it was a new day. And if you had an athletic champion, you could expose him and put him on television as long as you didn't give the big matches away and as long as you didn't beat it to death. There's some truth in there, but it depends on the talent, the situation, and what gets them over more, being being seen to be really good or not being seen. So they're not seen through. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. And I think there's a lot of interesting ways to look at all this because we know how things turned out. They went with sting and the black scorpion sting was on TV every week while the black scorpion did his magic. 
<laughs> leading into various matches. But hear more of this classic audio, as well as us talking all about it, at pwspod.com, or look for John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, then and now, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! That's a supplemental scream. I'm sorry, ma'am. The newest episode in production right now. Let me announce a couple of things you'll hear on the episode. We talk to a man who will be nameless. An anonymous man who researched the death of Gino Hernandez. I'm talking about someone who met up with people in parking lots late at night. And he doesn't want his identity out there. But this is going to be a really interesting talk and a look at what may have happened to Gino Hernandez. A lot of people still have questions. How did Gino Hernandez die? We're going to look at some of the potential answers on the next 605. Also, if anybody can crack this case, it's you. Me and a nameless man in a parking lot. And a nameless man in a parking lot. I've, I've, many times you have had some of your best encounters with nameless men in parking lots. Unlike you in the restroom. Well, at least I'm enclosed. Got a roof over my <laughs> head and a wall around me for heaven's sake. <laughs> awesome on the next six I just out there in the middle of nowhere. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, George Michael. On the yes. next 605, also, the return of Fumi Saito for the latest installment in our popular look at the history of Japanese wrestling. We are right now in the mid 1980s. Hear that and much, much more. We'll announce more next week. Go through the archives today at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mothership! Oh, God damn it. All right, Mothership. Um, better late than never. We're a couple of days late, but they, they had another episode of the Wednesday Night Wars on September 16th, the day before my birthday. And at, when last we left this thrilling competition... I had said that the NXT show last week was probably my favorite wrestling program from any company that I'd seen over the past at least few months. Did I not? I think it so. was pretty. I liked it. It was great. They did a good job. I gave them the clap. You did. I did. You gave them the clap. I gave them the clap. <clears throat> well, I should have took it back. Uh, now, <laughs> they, they can't do two in a row. I'll tell you that. But there were still some things here. But go ahead and browbeat me. The opening match was Shotzi Blackheart versus Io Shirai. And I invoked the tank rule. Because while Rhea Ripley would trump the tank rule, Io Shirai does not. So I fast forwarded because of the tank. No, you and I'm didn't. now I'm waiting to hear you browbeat me as oh it was so great it was the opening match you skipped the opening match on the show yes because it was Shotzi Blackheart driving a fucking tank to the ring and it lasted twenty minutes Io Shirai is super talented she's really good what do you think of the match then well listen I think it's important to note that I was running low on time uh huh so I fast forwarded to the ending of the <laughs> match. <laughs> I was hoping you actually watched it this time. <laughs> well, at least you had the excuse you were running low on time. No, I <laughs> I couldn't believe. <sighs> Last week, I loved the show so much. I turned this on, and the first thing I see is Shotzi, Blank, Shotzi Blankheart coming out in a fucking tank. So I fast-forwarded to the finish. This thing went 20 minutes, the first 20 minutes of the program. So once again... They're just handing, now that they're opposed. Last week, they had a great fucking show. I, I think that week they weren't opposed. Now they're opposed, and they hand off the first 20 minutes to the opposition. However, Io Shirai, your second coming of Mildred Burke, won with an, an attempted moonsault. I say attempted moonsault because it was really a backflip off the top rope into a double knee drop on poor old Shotzi and looked like it could have killed her. Is that what you saw? Did you see the finish? I saw the finish. I thought it was very spectacular. Yeah, stiff. Anyway. <laughs> Not the stiffest match that a woman will have on the Wednesday Night Wars this week. 
Well, no, not on purpose, at least, or by accident. By accident, it was the stiffest, but not on purpose. Anyway, um, they did a nice little package on Tommaso Ciampa with him watching the footage of him killing that fucking guy a week or two ago, and then he comes out against good old Desmond Troy. Uh, <sighs> Tommaso Ciampa, I love the entrance. I love the outfit. I love the mask. I love the facials. I love the beard. I love the attitude when he takes the shit off. He took the guy down and leaned into everything. He sold the guy at the guy's level, which I'll explain in a second. We've talked about it before, but for the new listeners, but he sold the guy at the guy's level and it got right back on him and he was aggressive the whole time and he dropped him with a DDT boom, one, two, three, and it was perfect. Perfect. It wasn't the greatest match in the world. It wasn't supposed to be. It was a perfect match to get Tommaso Ciampa over, show he's aggressive, et cetera, et cetera, showcase him in a good way. <clears throat> and when I say he sold Desmond Troy at his level, how many times do you see a, a supposed main event star wrestle a guy that's obviously always booked in the middle of the card or at the opening of the card and doesn't really win, definitely loses more than he wins. But when that guy makes a comeback or even fires up or whatever, that main event guy is bumping like a fucking Super Bowl. No. Whether it's, and we've talked about this before, whether it's a job guy, whether it's a, a talented worker that's being used underneath, or a, a more main event guy that's on your level, you sell three different ways. You sell at the guy's level, not at his talent level. He can be the greatest wrestler in the world, but at the level that he has been promoted at in that environment, if you take big bumps for a fucking job guy, you're a goddamn idiot. If you're a main event star, cause it's a job guy, maybe the nicest guy in the world, but he's presented as a job guy or conversely, what would happen? Would there be a fist fight? If it was a main event guy you were working with and you decided you didn't want to sell at all. It's the same thing. You sell at the guy's level that the fans perceive him at, that he's presented at, not at his talent level. So Tommaso, he'd sell, he'd register, he'd come right back. And then at the end of the thing, Jake Atlas came out and did some white milk baby face promo as a challenge for next week because he hadn't had enough. And then fucking this, every time I hear Jake Atlas speak, I want Tommaso to hurt him worse. But what do you think of Tommaso? I like Tommaso. I'm curious to see where they're going to go with him. I mean, there's something later on in the show with him and Kyle O'Reilly. I'm curious to see where that will go. But it kind of what you just said about selling to the other guy's level goes back to the Steve Beverly and Pettacino stuff, talking about Sting shouldn't be wrestling Barry Horowitz. And that made me think of Flair in there with George South. Nothing against Barry Horowitz or George South. Both really talented wrestlers. Unfortunately, because of the way they were used, it's a little ridiculous to have a 15 minute match on TV with them. Yeah. So I, I thought that was. And, and, and also that that's the thing when you go back and you watch. Yes. If it was poor old Ron Rossi, bless him, look like a baked potato with arms and legs. He wouldn't get any offense. He called him a one tackle pancake. You beat Ron Rossi up and beat him. George South never won any more than Ron Rossi, but George South could work and he, you could see it and he was a good looking athlete. So you would give him more flair gave him too much, but he loved working with him, but you'd give him more, but still a main event guy, top guy would be in control of the situation. It wouldn't be until you had a competitive main event matchup where there was doubt in people's mind on a television match because you should never put doubt in people's mind that a, a preliminary wrestler is going to beat one of your main event guys on television unless you are in the middle of elevating that preliminary wrestler to main event status and then it better be a good story anyway <clears throat> um finn balor they did a sit down package here it was well done he's well spoken he's convincing i'm a little tired of dark and moody i miss the guys just being able to come out and the fucking announcer having the microphone and the guy being able to cut a goddamn shit talking promo. Let me tell you something, Mr. TV announcer, blah, blah, blah. But this was, it's starting to, the sit downs are starting to be the norm instead of the exception. Used to be the other way around. 
And that made the sit downs stand out as a little more real and a little more legitimate. But now they're all done that way. And anyway, a, the, the, the next match was Austin Theory versus Kushida. And I completely took this match totally wrong. And I don't know what the fuck they're doing, but they need to rethink it. Austin Theory does a promo. He's very good. He's I got a smart ass attitude and a slappable face, but he's a good looking athlete. And that okay, because remember we've complimented him before. He was the human ping pong ball for Bronson Reed and did a great job. Pretty much stole the show. And okay, now he's got a promo. And then here comes Kushida. Well, we haven't seen Kushida in a while. And I figure, okay, they're bringing in Kushida to put old Austin Theory over because they see they've got something. Because Kushida, I made mention in my notes, is the second coming of Little Tokyo. Oh, come on. This fucking guy is not as tall as the top rope. And it was... it. Whereas I loved Austin Theory's work against Bronson Reed from start to finish, it, this match was awkward as fuck with the stuff that Kushida was doing until Austin Theory took over. And then when he took over and he was dictating the pace, it got good. Uh, I don't know what's with Kushida's ring outfit. It looked like he was dressed as a recently furloughed house painter. And then it had a paint fight. I don't know what the fuck. He did awkward kicks for a, a comeback. They did a spot where Austin Theory hurt his arm on the post when he fucking missed a forearm. And <clears throat> Kushida gets him in the ring and double wrist locks him and he taps out. I thought Austin Theory was the star here and Kushida was being used as a generic Japanese midget to put him over. And that's still to me what it looked like until Kushida won the match. You Is somebody trying to tell me that they believe that there is a bigger upside in little itty bitty Kushida, another Japanese guy with strange markings on his attire? What? <laughs> Instead of Austin Theory, can talk, can cut a promo, good-looking athlete, young kid, already a natural at, in the ring. And I, what the fuck happened here? Can you explain this to me? I can't explain it. I was certainly surprised by the finish. I agree with you that Austin Theory has a world of potential, and he's been pretty impressive the little we've seen of him. Kushida's a really talented professional wrestler. He's really, really good. He is a smaller guy. I think comparing him to little Tokyo is a bit much. Why, why don't we do a thing where, where he's one of the guys they have, like they used to put the ships in the bottle. Why don't he join a wrestling crew where they have matches in a bottle? Cause he'll be able to crawl in even a fucking two liter. Like you said, I'm surprised by the finish. I think Kushida's talented, but I would be looking at ways to elevate Austin theory. <sighs> Then we proceed to another clip at home with the same faces, Mr. And Mrs. Same face and uh, Mrs. Same face. Now is blue haired. It was gray. Now it's blue, but it's not like a, like a dark blue, like cool blue. It's kind of like a light blue, like fucking Pepto-Bismol, the magic clown blue. <laughs> anyway, um, so she's mad at her ex friend for breaking their TV. And I just, I just wrote, God, these segments are rotten. It's so fucking phony. It's what the fuck? They're just reciting lines with blank stares. It, nobody can believe this. I don't know what, the, uh, what the fuck. Do you have anything to say about this before we move on? I don't know why they're doing this. It doesn't, it's not good. And they keep going back to the Gargano household. It's not good. It's really not good. I don't know why As, they keep doing this. In the words of Ole Anderson, when he closed a territory down in the summer of 83, don't do this anymore. Why are you doing this? Yeah, I mean, I understand something like this. I'm not justifying it, but I understand crap like this being on a Vince McMahon produced show where he's hands on. I don't know well, what this is doing on NXT. No, I actually, I, I see this on a local television show because the audio is bad. The lighting is bad because it, it really is their apartment. I don't know what, I don't see this on a big budget show. I see this on local indie wrestling. <sighs> anyway, 
The NXT Tag Team Championship was next, and here comes the new champions, Fan Dancer, dressed as sexy policemen. Would you want any, either of these cops to give you a ticket, Brian? Certainly not. <sighs> <laughs> so Fan Dancer beat Imperium, the two G German guys that aren't Walter. And this is the rematch where Fan Dancer are defending against Imperium. And the Fan Dancer comes out and does the entrance where they're dressed as the, the stripper cops. And I just, I hate this gimmick so bad, so bad that uh, the heels, uh, Imperium hit the ring hot. There was an exchange of fake punches that nobody meant. And then the baby faces immediately shit canned the heels to the floor. And, and then they fucking started the match again. So that was just useless. And I got to be honest here. Um, at this point, this was going a while. These two teams look like any four fucking white guys on the indies. Fan Dancer has the goofiest entrance outside of AEW and wrestling. These guys are all four better workers and in better shape than most of the AEW roster, but they're just fucking there. These guys are just there. And during this match, Harley needed belly rubs. And I lost track of what the fuck was going on. So I, I, I looked back when I, I saw a backslap tag in there and I, that I didn't need any more reason to tune out, but they can't even try. They don't even fucking try anymore, but their finish was so complicated and went a hundred miles an hour. I was trying to keep track of it and I lost track again, but in the middle of it, one of the white guys caught the uh, another one of the white guys coming off the top rope in a vertical suplex position. It was the bald headed German that did it. And I've never seen that before. And he's not that big of a guy, but he must be stout as fuck. And I started paying some more attention and I've come to figure out that the bald German is great. It's just the baby faces gimmicks are, is so offensive. And the other German just looks like pudding compared to the rest of the NXT guys. Um, that Tyler Breeze's up and overs are the worst I've ever seen. War the absolute worst. Do you know what I'm saying by up and over? No, explain. When you're missing a clothesline, when a guy's going to duck the clothesline. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when the guy ducks the clothesline, you swing your fucking arm so high that Andre the Giant wouldn't have had to bend over and you still wouldn't have hit him just to make sure you don't hit him. Worst I've ever seen on Tyler Breeze, up and over. Fuck, knock the fucking guy out if he doesn't duck. The, your hands are clean if he was supposed to duck. That's what I told referee Carl Fergie to tell Dusty Rhodes in the Superdome the first time we worked with, uh, with him because we weren't in the same locker room, heels and baby faces. I was supposed to swing the fucking the cane I had at the time because the racket was banned. I said, please, Carl, please tell Dusty to duck because I'm going to swing at his head. And he loved that. When I actually talked to him the first time on the phone months later, he says, see, you're the kid who's going to knock the dream out in the Superdome. <laughs> anyway, um, they foiled the heels finish and won, and the NXT Tag Team Championship belts look like shit if these guys are the champions. Because it's, it's an obvious rehash of two guys that have been there forever that both then they put in a male stripper gimmick and it's just it screams mid-card tag team popcorn match and these this is the they have still they have fish and o'reilly they have other tag teams in nxt and these guys are the champions so they don't care any more about tag team wrestling in nxt than they do anywhere else in the fucking wwe empire What'd you think? It was all right. Uh, like you said, the bald headed guy in Imperium. I don't know who is who in Imperium. Marcel Marceau and Bartholomew. <laughs> yeah, Marcel I, I, Marceau and Bartholomew J. Frog. I don't, I don't fucking know. Yeah, I don't know what their names are. But, you know, I will say this about Breezango. I almost called him Fandancer there. Fandango at least has a look. Tyler Breeze used to look different. Now he's kind of taken all of that away. He just looks like a bland little white guy. And I don't know. I just thought he looked so out of place just based on how he looked in there. He didn't look like a wrestler. 
I, I will give you that fan dancer, if it wasn't for just for a fan dance, now I'm doing a fandango and see that it's not like I could have fucking been into him till they gave him the shitty fan dancer gimmick because it's, it's, it's it, the whole fandango name and gimmick and et cetera. The guy's a good looking athlete. And if he had been booked somehow differently to be more, I don't know anything that you would take as a top guy. Instead of, you know, I guess, was this an era when they were handing out more T.L. Hopper and the goon gimmicks? Let me tell you something. Fandango was involved in maybe my favorite stupid raw angle of all time. It was Fandango and he had some girl dancing with him. And he was confronting, I think, Lord Tenzai, which was Matt Bloom, um, A-Train. Oh, yeah, when, when, when he became Japanese. and. Uh, what was the name of the of the the guy with the Funkadactyls? Brodus Clay. Brodus Clay. So he's confronting them, and <laughs> Lord Tenzai keeps getting on the microphone. He's like, hey, Fandango! And he would cut him off and go, no, no, no. It's Fandango. And it was just, he went back and forth doing his stupid thing over and over, and he just wanted to dance with Naomi. And this is all in front of the arena. It was so stupid. I remember watching this going, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen on television. Yet I'm thoroughly amused by it. I wish it wasn't on wrestling. Is he foreign? He no. has the ac accent. At that time, time, at that time, he was kind of, I was about to say he was a dancer. So naturally he sounded foreign, but I don't know what the reasoning was for the accent that he had at the time. Maybe he just like Booker T. He'd come up with that. Booker T used to fucking try out different accents on TNA wrestling that he could use in his acting career that he was going to have. And he'd just, he'd just be talking. And, and I've, I'd ask the other guy, Dutch or Jeff or anybody, I said, why is he talking with an accent? First, he became English because he was King Booker and he's all the kings are in <laughs> England. And then he'd just have act, different accents. And one day he'd be, he'd be a Cockney. And then he'd, he'd be, you know, whatever the, f I don't fucking know. I anyway. like Madonna, Madonna, this girl from Detroit, all of a sudden she has a British accent. That's my favorite one. Well, Vogue. Anyway, <laughs> have you seen what she looks like lately? I haven't checked. It's not my week to watch her. What does she look like? Looks like Waylon Flowers' hand should be up her ass. <laughs> What was next on this show? <laughs> okay. If anybody had Waylon Flowers and Madam in the pop culture reference pool, you've officially cashed to go to my bookie to collect your prize. Okay. <laughs> the next match amongst this parade of terror, a girls tag match, Katie K Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter against Jesse Kania and Zia Lee. And that's when I wrote in capital letters, I swear to God, last week, this was the best show from any company in months. Zia Lee is apparently, she's not a Japanese school girl. She's a Chinese school girl. Is it Zia Lee or Zia Lee? Zia Lee, Zia Lee. I can't remember. It was XIA. Was it? Oh. Okay. Uh, I thought it yeah, was that's, way, that's the way it was pronounced on or pronounced spelled on the goddamn um, graphic is X I A L I. Point is, I was extremely disappointed in Zia Lee, and I fucking fast forward it. Zia Lee wasn't five feet tall. None of these girls were taller than the top rope, except for Jesse Kania, and she looked like she was six feet fucking five. And I've never heard of any of these people. Well, Carter and Catanzaro, I've heard yeah, of slightly. Yeah, she was on, uh, she may have won even. I'm not sure. She was on American Ninja Warrior. You ever watch well, that? Well, good for her. Every once in a while, only when, uh, you know, paralyzed or in an iron lung and unable to get to the remote did I watch that program. But <laughs> uh, was there anything to this? You know, I was, I was stuck for time. <laughs> Unfortunately, okay. considering none of these... Women have been involved in a feud with the other women, and I kind of didn't care about the match. I fast-forwarded the match. You are misogynistic. You are a misogynistic person, Brian Lan, you and you you eke out your living from marginalized peoples around the world. <laughs> that is so unfair. By shitting on them. How dare you? 
All right. Well, coming up, we, I thought we were going to have a match here. Bobby Fish and Roderick Strong. And it doesn't have to be Fish and O'Reilly. It can be Fish and Strong. It can be Strong and O'Reilly. The, any combination of these guys, I want to see them. Against Drake Maverick and Killian Dane. And we recalled it last week on the program. As you were, will recall, our space family Robinson was trapped. Um, Killian Dane reluctantly helped Drake Maverick out and then punched him one punch and knocked him out. Because Drake and then Dra they've signed this tag match, but Killian Dane don't want to be Drake's partner. There's drama, blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and if he's listening, Drake Maverick, I like this guy as a human being and as a person, and he can work. He was properly trained. He went to OVW. He's been around the world. He's in shape. He's n Drake Maverick is what Marco Stunt would be if he was all those things, in shape, properly trained, not on meth, took care of his teeth, ate properly, went to school. His mother hadn't smoked or done heroin when she was pregnant. Oh, come on. Drake Maverick is all those things. And I like him as a person, and he's still too fucking small. It's just, it, I'm sorry. I have to be consistent, and I have to be fair. And this kid can work. And I can see how they have put him into issues and things, and there's a place for him to be used, but as an actual wrestler on an ongoing basis, it's the visual, and I'm sorry. And then they do the thing where Killian Dane refuses to come out. And and so he goes two against one against poor against Roderick Strong and Bobby Fish, this poor guy that's half the size of either one of them. He's going two on one. Yes, you're creating sympathy for an underdog baby face, and you're also creating a lot of people going, what the fuck is this? Look, this, they're used to seeing grown kick-ass men, at least on WWE programming. Of grown men, maybe not all of them. I don't think Tyler Breeze is a kick-ass guy. But the point is, there was, it was lots of action, but they mostly beat Drake Maverick up, as it should have been, two against one. But then it got ridiculous that he kept fighting back. And then they went through a break. And now, it, it, when they come back from the break on the other side, William Regal makes Killian Dane go out. But So now, after not being able to put Drake Maverick away two against one in the previous 10 minutes. Strong and Fish are in there. And this, uh, honestly, let's call a spade a spade. This fat, hairy slob gets in and beats up both of the heels <laughs> simultaneously after they haven't been able to put a guy half their size away in two on one in the previous 10 minutes. And then the heels get disqualified for using a chair that Killian Dane barely sold. In the first place. And then the heels just get out of there, so they're fucking just pissing their mouth while they're down there, might as well. And then Drake Maverick gets knocked out by Killian Dane with one punch again. So just in case we're keeping track of the logic here, Killian Dane can knock Drake Maverick out with one punch. Both strong and Fish together, two on one, can't beat him for a three count, pin him in 10 minutes. You see where I'm going with this? Just because you can cut your own ear off doesn't mean you're Van Gogh. And just because some people could do all these things doesn't mean these particular people should have done these things. Bullshit mid-card comedy and a waste of Bobby Fish and Roderick Strong's talent. But change my mind. No, I can't disagree with you at all. And I thought it was interesting seeing Strong and Fish, as opposed to Fish and O'Reilly, who we're used to. I was wondering, where's Kyle O'Reilly? We would find out later in the show. But I don't know what the hell they're doing here. I don't know why I'm supposed to care about Drake Maverick. And, you know, once again, did you see fine the, young man. Did you but, see when they had him, they, they filmed him coming to the arena earlier in the show? Oh, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, I didn't even make note of that. But he, it, it's it's a comedy routine where he's trying to act like that he and Killian Dane are going to be a great team. But well, he hadn't really heard from Killian Dane, and he didn't text him. He doesn't have his number, and he hadn't seen him or what. It, it, they try to 
illustrate to you that this is a setup fucking deal. None of it's to be taken seriously. It's all scripted or whatever. Nobody would say or say these things or they wouldn't be shot and said in this way and then expect you to care when they do the match. And you don't. And that's why. Well, it was an interesting segment because I learned that if a car hits a speed bump during a promo, your mind immediately goes to someone's about to run out of that car and attack the wrestler. (laughs) But they don't. It's just a speed bump. There was a speed bump right behind them, and the car did the bounce on it. I'm like, oh, my God, someone's about to get him. No, it was just a speed bump. No, that was a guy from the other company trying to get out of the trunk of the car. Um, (laughs) Save it. All right, speaking of parking lots, we're back out in the parking lot with Jake Atlas doing another shitty promo. and and Just a a white meat, white milk, baby face, generic, not with any feeling promo. And Champa levels him and kicks the shit out of him quick and to the point with two or three fucking moves. Boom, boom, boom. And here comes Kyle O'Reilly and says, come on, it's a parking lot. Leave him alone. You proved your point. So now we we have Champa and O'Reilly, I would say two heels, except Champa's done a pretty good job of just being on his own and a nut and mad at everybody. And O'Reilly since the whole undisputed era really switched babyface in the thing with Pat McAfee, O'Reilly and Champa should be very interesting. Two guys that work differently from everybody else and believe in making people believe their shit. I want to see that. Well done. Yeah, me too. I want to see that match. And it appears and- that fit that O'Reilly and Cole are babyface and fish and strong are still technically heel based on that previous segment. Well, they were working as heels, but they're pretty much baby faces too, because now the the television has told the people that not only are these guys really good, but also we should cheer them because they held up for Adam Cole and against the mean football player and blah, blah, blah. So I, it's all so confused, uh, but in they've instilled in people's mind that everybody in the undisputed era is somebody they should be pulling for, whether they know it or not. I don't know. But anyway. Speaking of well done, the next match for the North American title, Damian Priest and Timothy Thatcher. And I've, I've said, I love, I think Priest is a, 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 a he's going to be a superstar. He's already way ahead of most of these guys. I like Thatcher here because with a guy with, when Thatcher worked with what, who was it he worked with a couple weeks ago and they just, they really just had a grappling match and it was well done, but dry. Who was it? Oh shit. I actually don't you remember. Remember? See? Yeah, you don't because that's the thing. Timothy Thatcher in that match, they were doing shit that like Eddie Graham, you say Billy Robinson, Tony Charles, good to have on the card, not in the main event. But Thatcher alone with a different personality, one-on-one against somebody else that's more traditional pro wrestler, Thatcher can do his shit. It gets over, and and it's not really just dry except for the, the, uh, the, the, the real expert, the real enthusiast of grappling. Anyway, they locked up. Imagine they've already got points when you lock up to start a match since nobody ever locks up, start to fucking match anymore. And Thatcher did that fucking lock up control and he fucking, he leans into everything. It looks fucking legitimate. I like Damien Priest's poise and timing and attitude. He works differently. It turned into a slobber knocker. Damien Priest does a lot of those looping kicks and spinning kicks that old Dino douche on the other program wishes he could do. Uh, they went through a break, which wasn't bad because they were fucking cooking fairly well. When, when they came back from the break, Thatcher had Damien Priest in almost a, in a sugar hold. He, he wasn't cinched up on that. He would have popped fucking Damien Priest's eardrums, but he had him in the sugar. Um... I noted that uh, Priest punches and strikes have oomph. Uh, he did a great comeback. I like the Timothy Thatcher's rubber-legged cells. Turned into a good match. Thatcher kept going for submissions. Priest kept up with him, was right there for everything. You'd look at a guy like Priest, you'd say, I bet you he probably, he's got to have a weakness because he looks so good and he talks so good. 
he probably is timing or something's off. He was right there for everything. And they went back and forth. Uh, his spin kick off the top was a bit sideways. Uh, but he it still looked okay. It looked like he fucking hit him and then hit his finish on Thatcher. Boom, one, two, three. Very good fucking match. I, I you know, I, again, I say uh, a grown man, Damian Priest with bass in his voice. It's actually threat. Looks like he might could fucking do some damage. Thatcher, a, you know, pug faced fucking cauliflower eared fuck with crooked teeth that looks like he might do some damage. What happened to intimidating wrestlers? NXT is the only one that has them. I really like Thatcher, but with Priest, I mean, tell me if you think I'm wrong. And everyone on the NXT roster, not counting Kerry and Cross because he's out for a while, I think Priest has the most potential once he gets to Raw or SmackDown. As long as they, oh, don't, yeah. as long as they don't fuck him up. Well, you know what you said last time, and Keith Lee ended up in a tennis skirt. Yeah, but no, this guy, he exudes star quality. Yeah. And he's got a great look. He's got good size. He could talk. He's interesting in the ring. Not just good in the ring. He's interesting in the ring. I really like him, and uh, I like Thatcher, too, but I, I don't know if Thatcher's... If Vince McMahon's in charge, I don't think Thatcher should go to the main roster. No, no, because Vince, Vince wouldn't get it. But and, and here's the thing, Thatcher, if you're going to make a comparison here, think about this one. Thatcher is Arn Anderson, Priest is Ric Flair. Priest has the look to be the star and the individualism, Thatcher is the guy that can work probably top to bottom with most anybody and it doesn't get old. What do you think? You know, it's funny going back to the Beverly and Pettacino stuff on that episode, they said about how they would book sting. They said, you know, sting versus Arn Anderson probably won't do that much, but sting versus a Wyndham or a flair, you know, it's a whole nother story. <clears throat> I, I agree with you about, I agree with you. I can see that. I well, think. but also, but here's where they're. <sighs> they should have had Sting versus Arn before they would have Sting versus Flair or Sting versus Wyndham. Because Arn would get Sting ready for that match. Arn would make Sting look better than he had looked and in probably however long. And then you would use that momentum to go to Flair or to Wyndham, whoever had the fucking belt or whatever. But if you had that match first, Sting wouldn't look as strong. That's a I, that's why I told Hurd one time. I said you'd rather have Sid Vicious than Arn Anderson. He said, "Why not?" I said, "Sid'll draw you a million dollars in one night on pay per view." He said, "What's the matter with that?" I said, "Arn Anderson will draw you steady money and have great matches for five years, and nobody will get tired of it." Sid draws the million dollars one time. People have seen it; they don't want to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. There you have it. Anyway, uh, that was the NXT offering, which there, as we saw, there was good things intermixed in the bowl of turd salad. But now we get to the main turd course. I'll tell you how you get away from a turd salad. You go straight to the main event. I'm talking about shaving your nuts. <laughs> Folks, our friends at Manscaped are ready to give you a main event crotch. We're not going to fool around with any preliminary talent down there, folks. We're going to give you the main event, the absolute best personal grooming tool that has ever been manufactured in the history of mankind, the Lawnmower 3.0. You're not going to have to take tweezers and pluck your poobs out one at a time. You're not going to have to use these plastic disposable razors and these cheap things and you're not going to have to use scissors and you're not going to have to use a weed whacker you're not going to have to use any of those things because the lawnmower 3.0 will make mr johnson and the twins as slick as come on a gold tooth and you will not lose one drop of blood while you're doing it folks manscape not only has the perfect package 3.0 with the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer. It also has an LED light so you can backlight those little bastards and cut them down. It, it, your, your crotch will look like the, the sights of the wildfires in California, completely barren. You can get all the hair off. Also, the Manscaped Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. 
Also, the the new Shears 2.0 package, the nail trimmers. I'm telling you, Manscaped can keep you feeling good, looking good, and smelling good. And right now, if you go to manscaped.com and subscribe to the perfect package and get a new replacement blade refill for your lawnmower 3.0 delivered to your door every three months to make sure your trimmer is always fresh and clean, for a limited time, subscribers get not one but two free gifts. The travel bag, that's a $39 value, and the patented high-performance anti-chafing Manscaped boxers. Once that they're free of the woolly swamp, they're going to want a nice anti-chafing hammock to swing around in. The perfect package for your perfect package, folks. Go to manscaped.com, use the code JCE, get 20% off and free shipping and the two free gifts. Holy man, they're they're just giving it to you. Use the code JCE, 20% off, free shipping, two free gifts if you subscribe to the perfect package. Folks, I don't know how much better we can do for you. Use the code JCE and make taking care of your balls the most important part of your day. Thanks, Manscaped. Well, Jim, speaking of main event crotch, I guess the main event of this show is the AEW Review. Well, in that case, I hate that we've false advertised and led people to believe they were going to hear something interesting because what the... I'll get to the main controversy here. Let's go over the show from the start because they start out once again, whereas NXT just decides to give it away uh, because they're opposed and they start out with a 20 minute girls match with a girl in a green hair and a tank. They do the opposite on AEW. They get right into whatever they're going to get into for no rhyme and reason. Uh, Jurassic express and the dwarf were in the ring and they're ready for their, tag team match and suddenly here comes road warrior and his brother balding buck they get in the ring and double super kick the referee and leave and walk back to the back and of course the camera follows them and they pull out a stack of money that i assume that tony khan had given them before they went on the program and threw their fines and now this is what confused me because the announcer said that they're there, they're paying their fines to Tony Khan, but I couldn't see Tony Khan because some goof in some t shirt, a baggy pair of shorts, and a fucking set of flip flops was sitting <laughs> apparently sitting in front of Tony Khan because he's the one that got the money. And then the Bucks walked off, and we never saw them again on the whole program. Am I being led to believe that that's Tony Khan, the billionaire owner of this entire company that has not been established? As a television personality, he's not regularly seen on TV, so you don't know that, well, he normally dresses like a goddamn executive and an owner of a major sports franchise, but in this case, he dressed like he just walked off the beach. It, we're just apparently to believe that Tony Khan doesn't dress any better than the rest of these bums that come out in their fucking baggy shorts and t-shirts. Is that what we're being led to believe here? Yeah, I guess so. He was blinking like a... Uh... I don't know if he had too much Ritalin or he just woke up or what this problem was there. It looked like he might have just rolled out of bed dressed up. Maybe that was his his pajama outfit. I don't know, but what the fuck? So on one show, we've got a match that nobody wants to see for 20 minutes. And on the other show, we've got a match that they might want to see, but we've got to inter interrupt it for this young bucks being in a dark place. And then after the bucks do that then they make snide remarks to ftr and then ftr and tully come out the formatting of this show is it looks like it was done in a mix master just put a bunch of pieces in hit the button on puree for a second and see how it comes out so then we finally get to see ftr against dino douche and jungle boy and jungle boy started out the match and if he could work with guys like this every week he would be a superstar this kid's a natural he can sell. He's got the movement. He's got the look. He's just always in these goofy matches with the other gymnasts, and he gets bad habits, and he's not going to learn anything. If he could work with guys like fucking Dax and Cash on a regular basis, he would be uh, 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 fantastic, brilliant. Anyway, but he doesn't, so he probably won't be. Um, 
I, FTR got a, a spot at the start out of Dino where it looked like he knew what he was doing. Uh, there was a lot of action, but the shit made sense and everything looked good. And they kept, if you notice, they kept Dino into a minimum at the, at the start and through most of it. Uh, they got heat on jungle boy and they did some nice tags, some nice double teams. And it was an okay hot tag to Dino. It wasn't molten. Poor old Jungle Boy didn't know how to crawl to the neutral corner being disoriented and let the fucking heel who tags first, let the fresh heel come in and almost get him so he can duck or dodge or roll or whatever. But anyway, um, Dino made the same awkward kick and clothesline comeback that he always does, but this one was more palatable and acceptable because the heels fed him and their placement was perfect. He didn't have to fucking go get everybody. And of course, he had to get his standing backflip in for a two count. It, it lets it, somebody alert me the next time that Dino Douche has a match and he doesn't do a standing backflip just to do something different. Somebody, because every fucking time for a two count, did I mention? Then Jungle Boy tags back in, and then we go back and forth and. Jungle Boy gets several false finishes, which were good, but then we start getting complicated. And finally, it ends up with Dino doing a big dive into the crowd, and I wrote, please be out of this match. Um, FTR got a roll-up on Jungle Boy, finally, to win the thing with an assist from Tully. They were in the corner, they had the leverage, whatever. But, And I know they're, t they're trying to be modern, but... It's an epidemic. Every time that the heels get heat, Babyface makes the hot tag, they make a comeback, then they go into shit, and then they proceed to go for this. It wasn't this bad in this case, but sometimes they go for five or ten more minutes. This went for several more minutes. Y your clock is ticking on whether this is any good, unless you're having a classic match for the title on pay-per-view, which this wasn't. Don't just do every goddamn thing. After the baby face has come back, the clock is ticking on how much interest you've got and whether you're going to lose people or whether you got the momentum, right? After Dino's big comeback, he could have done his fucking dive and then Jungle Boy's false finishes and they could have gone into the finish right there. It got so complicated that you lost the plot on... What the fuck? Why did they beat Jungle Boy up all that time to give the fresh man the tag? And they've got the people up, and then they just do stuff back and forth where Jungle Boy has to come back and be perfectly healthy, and everybody's got to contribute to this thing. It's one of the better, best Jungle Boy and Dino douche matches that I've seen because FTR can work wonders. We've seen now with anybody but Kenny Olivier. But goddamn, some of these things just go so long and so many twists and turns. Every. Every race can't be Le Mans. Every it 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 just it every match can't be the main event of Starcade. Get your heat, get your hot tag, get a nice comeback, get a couple of twists and turns, go the fuck home. So yes, I mean, you know, FTR as we mentioned uh, uh, on basics and positioning and and execution and everything else is so f and and laying shit out is so far ahead above everybody. But they have to, at some point in the match, start doing everybody else's modern shit, and that takes it down a level in my mind. So, bit complicated at the end. They had a minute or two in there, they could have fucking cut it down, and it would have been so much better. Just get out while the getting's good. What'd you think? I thought it was all right. I, I by and large, enjoyed it. I will say that the more I see Luchasaurus, the less I feel like he's anything special at all. He had a great look at the start, but the more you see of him, the more that you see that it's always the same shit, yeah. and it, it, it he can't he can't be protected from himself. It's always the backflip. It's always the you know the kicks. He's one of the big offenders when it comes to slapping your thigh. Jump oh, and that that goddamn now that it's being popularized, that head palm shoot off will make me shoot my TV screen one of these days. Yeah, he, I I throw my pin when they're doing that now. He does that every match. Every match. Jungle Boy's really good. He's been misused for the entirety of 2020. We'll see what happens now. FTR continued to impress me 
Dax, we said it before, he's one of the best workers in the business. Everything he does in the ring makes sense. Everything looks good. He's always in the right place. His feet are always in the right place. <laughs> Cash is underrated because he's really good too. Yeah. And he does a lot of good power moves. They're a phenomenal tag team. I wish they had more competition to work with in AEW. There's nothing else I can really say about it. I thought it was a good opener, all things considered. In the well, world a- of AEW, it was a yes. very good opener. Oh, it was, it, was, it was definitely better than what was on the other channel for the first 20 minutes. Uh, but then exactly. we went after that to Officer Bar Brady and some really bad acting school students in the back who had found Matt Hardy laying on the ground selling his leg. And then Jericho and Sammy Hagar come in and take credit for it. And so that uh, obviously took Matt Hardy out of helping his friend's private party in their match with Jericho and Hager later on, and also was more phoniness and more bullshit. No, nobody would ever believe that those guys that were standing over Matt Hardy were really upset and that they meant what they said. Not the announcer, not the guys that found him. No, why do we, Matt Hardy did a great promo where he said he was going to, after nearly getting killed and having brain damage, he was going to take some time off and get healthy. And he's at every show since, but this was the only time we saw him. Was it that important that they have to do something else phony to lay Matt Hardy out and nobody believes it or just say, well, private party's going to go without the advice of Matt Hardy because he's off selling a fucking concussion. I, I will say this. I disagree with you a little bit on that. Private party were the least of the problems in this segment. Alex Marvez can make anything seem phony. He is so unnatural and he's not good on camera. And just the words that come out of his mouth seem contrived. Yeah. I re- after you said it last time, I rewatched that Young Buck super kicking thing over and over and over. <laughs> where he just grips the microphone. He goes down holding the microphone. He, it, 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 he didn't even go down and take a bump. He just leaned backwards over off camera. Holding the mic. The, holding as, the microphone the whole time. As tight as he can the whole time. He's really, really bad on there. They've had other people do that role. Assuming that someone else can get to Jacksonville, even with the pandemic, have Dasha do it. She's great on camera. She knows how to not seem disingenuous. Alex Marvez, you want to talk about a black hole of charisma. (laughs) He puts Brody Lee to shame. That's all I wanted to say about that. All righty. Well, we continue on with the next match is going to have a special guest color commentator, Kenny Olivier. Twinkle Toes McFingerbang himself joined the announce team apparently to give a feminine perspective on the situation. I'm not talking about his sexual preferences in any way. I'm talking about the fact that he has a woman's voice, a woman's haircut. He looks like an old wash woman. And he brings the same level of excitement as an old wash woman would to this commentary about uh, his on again, off again relationship with Adam page. And like anybody could give a shit because the match was Kazarian against page. Frankie Kazarian has hair again. He looks 15 years younger. Thank God. I hate guys that are bald headed on purpose. Um, I noted that Olivier stuttered and lisped and stammered in an unconvincing and completely unintimidating manner. He sounds like he's also 14 years old. Um, This match was two of, uh, once again, of the only well-trained and good-looking athletes that are veterans on the roster. And the match was, was fine. There are no, once again, no clear baby face and heel here. So they just went back and forth, but this is AEW. So we're lucky that both guys are actually grown adult graduates of a wrestling school, but still they're good athletes. They had, they did some good shit. It showed to me that Paige could have gotten over and been a top singles guy by being booked like a proper wrestler from the start instead of being saddled with a ballet dancer for a partner and grade school drama class booking and being portrayed as an irresponsible fucking depressed drunk. 
which has always gotten everybody over that's getting, gotten that gimmick. I don't, you know, but anyway, basically that's the, it, it, it started going a bit long. They, they need more talent so they don't have to have these long matches every fucking time. And I hear people that they're apologists and even uncle Dave said, well, they have so much talent. They can't, get it all on television. They sure could if every match wasn't 20 minutes in apparently 100 degree heat and humidity in Florida till to, to the viewer is going, would you please just go home? They've got a two hour show. They could get all this talent on if they had a clue how to do it and any restraint. Um, I noted Olivier speaking now with the tone and excitement of a man on Xanax and helium at the same time. I asked the question, will they go home? The only thing worse than a 20-minute cold match, and a cold match is a match that has no real angle or issue or grudge or whatever behind it. Just book two guys, this guy versus this guy. The only thing worse than a cold match for 20 minutes is a 20-minute cold match between baby faces. Page one with a hell of a looking buckshot lariat. Uh, it was It was good and then long. And then, you know, page one, but he could have beat a heel for fuck's sake, except are they trying to make him a heel? Cause he's an irresponsible drunk. But if he's the heel, then you'd have to take the side of the fucking lisping Harpo marks lookalike who then limped off in his fucking t-shirt, sloppy shorts and shoes. Everybody here dresses like they live under an overpass. There will be no reunion. Tony Schiavone said, well, it was certainly very uncomfortable at times between Olivier and Paige. Yeah, it was uncomfortable for the fucking listeners. And then Paige drank a beer, not in a cool way like Steve Austin, just in a sad, drunk way, like give me a fucking beer. That's what I saw there. All right. Did, well. I, did I miss anything? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought it was all right. Like you said, it went really long. The, the problem for me with this match going this long, because they're both really talented guys and their work together was all right. But it's a match where the ending was not in question. Yeah. To go that long where you know who's going to win, you're just basically sitting there waiting for them to win. Or you were waiting for hopefully some interaction. Well, I don't even know if it, but I would say hopefully, but you were waiting for some interaction with Olivier and page that didn't happen. He was See, horrible on commentary. Oh, you think you were being too nice. I think, I think it made people, it made me care less about seeing them wrestle than I did before. <laughs> and he was dressed the same way. Tony Khan was maybe they're swapping out clothes in the back. They, they, they dress from the same fucking goodwill donation box. I don't know. Um, good guys match was way too long. Finish was never in question. Omega should never be on commentary ever again. Don't let him speak. Just don't let him speak. Even Harley's sitting here going, <laughs> it was horrible, horrible. Anyway, next up MJF with Wardlow taking on, Sean Dean. And here's how they formatted this fiasco. MJF enters with Wardlow, does his entrance, and they go to the break. And they do the picture-in-picture -picture thing. But still, it's MJF entering. And then when, when, he comes, when they come back on the other side of the break, there's no goddamn... It's like MJF is standing there with the guy, offers a handshake... Boom, the guy, what the fuck? I poke, arm bar, tap out. Ding, ding, ding. What the fuck? 20 minutes or 20 seconds? And now there's going, well, Cornette's complaining about it. Guys are supposed to get over. Should put a heel over in convincing fashion. Yeah. <laughs> Could he have two minutes? Could we just see what the fuck? Could we even see the introductions? Don't put a break in the middle of this if, if the match is only going to go 20 seconds. Any. If, if, Ugh. I'm okay with it going 20 seconds because it showed his intensity, but more importantly, because if him going 20 seconds meant they were going to give him a few minutes on the mic, it was a fair trade-off. Well, yeah, but okay, he can go, he's had promos after he's had matches before he can go a minute and a half and then do the same promo. 
or or just at least and it was just so abrupt coming back from the commercial if you were watching the entrance and then he gets in and he scoffs at the kid and then there's an introduction of a match or whatever and then a ding ding and then the fucking iPod whatever that might be it just it was broken up and abrupt and that's the problem we've got is shit either lasts 20 minutes or 20 seconds and then he does the promo rightly point out Moxley cheated <clears throat> proclaims himself the uncrowned AEW champion made old George Hamilton announce himself as or announce him as as such George Hamilton the ring announcer <laughs> Justin Roberts. Yeah. He reminds and then, me of the most annoying flight attendant <laughs> you've ever had. Just the one that's so happy to be there and wants everybody to know it. <laughs> uh, but then MJF talks about groups, stables, and factions. Oh, great. Now, wait a minute. Now, MJF is going to be in a group or a faction? Oh, joy. What the fuck? It. it uh, I thought we were concentrating on his relationship with Wardlow is somebody going to come in and muddy the waters what the great heel promo and delivery the group thing bothers me I don't know where the fuck this is going and it doesn't sound good because there's so many fucking groups already who isn't in a faction in AEW I, I, serious I, question I, I don't I don't know I have no idea and that's not even counting all the fraternal organizations like the Elks <laughs> Club that they belong to. Uh, and that, I mean, it was the interview. It was the interview. It was there. Um, they did the video of Taz breaking down Ricky Starks' finish. I think it's great. They ought to do more of that stuff. That looks, it looks so out of place on this fucking Benny Hill sketch show when they actually do shit that looks legitimate and means something. Um... The next, the promo, Eddie Kingston with the Butcher and the Baker and Felix and Penta L0.om five and seven eights. Uh, <laughs> dot om. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck his name is. I don't care. The Butcher and Baker stand out on the floor while he while Kingston has the Lucha Brothers in the ring. The Butcher and the Baker jerk some job guys out of the crowd in the front row and throw them in the ring, and all the heels gave them all a bunch of sloppy finishes. And then Eddie Kingston did a promo where they're all supposed to be together, but the, Eddie is alluding to shit. Like, and now you got to get your house in order, talking about the Baker, because I guess all the people that give a shit enough to research this, even though it's never been spoken on television, know that the former candlestick maker, AKA the former bunny who is now Allie is a baby face, but she was the butcher and Baker's manager when they were the Vic Tabak express. But now she's Brandy Runnels partner. And what the fuck? This this whole fucking thing is a complete waste of Eddie Kingston. This he can do promos, but he's alluding to shit that they haven't explained to the general population enough to to get his illusions. And he's trying to be real, but he's got a bunch of clowns doing stupid shit that's not real, jerking the guys in and just beating them up, and nobody does anything about. It. The show is anarchy. There are no rules nor constraints which means nothing stands out, gets heat, or gets remembered. And this was one of those things. Your, your thoughts on this fiasco? I love Eddie Kingston on the mic. I just wish they were doing something very different with him. I don't like him as a faction leader as much as I like him as a guy on the mic who then has a match. If they think we're going to be excited about the Butcher, the Vic Tabak Express, they were back in the Vic Tabak outfits. Well, that's true. If they that's think, true. If they think we're going to be excited about the Vic Tayback Express versus QT Marshall and Dustin Rhodes, I assume, if they're going to battle over the bunny, who gives a shit? The only thing it, it shows if you're if you're in a heel group and your wife is with the baby faces, it shows that wrestling is phony. So either use her as a fucking heel or give her the fucking boot. It's not like she's goddamn important. She does nothing and adds nothing except to stand there and look good in whatever outfit they dress her in. I think Eddie Kingston is phenomenal, and if I was booking, I would be using him in a much better fashion. He's really good. And we move from the understatement of the year to the next tag team match, Chris Jericho and Sammy Hagar against Private Party. 
Chris Jericho and Sammy Hagar, part of Inner Circle, the Le Champion, the top mainstream star in the company, former champion, top heel, and his partner, the muscle, the backup, Bellator MMA cage fighter. On this program, they have been portrayed as one guy who got dumped in a vat of orange juice by a guy who ought to be changing oil at Jiffy Lube. And the other guy got beat up by Sonny Kiss. And these are the top heels. And they're now going into a tag team match with Private Party. And this is the problem I've had with Jericho. We've talked about it. Instead of doing his shit, leading them and teaching them something, he's trying to prove he's a young fella and he's doing their shit. And then it all falls apart. And people, when I say Hager's so green on Twitter, they've been saying, well, he's been wrestling for 10 years or whatever. Well, he still needs to learn to think like a top guy. He still needs to learn to move like a top guy. And he still needs to learn to work like a top guy. He's green. His shit needs work. 10 years isn't that long to begin with. And most of it was in the WWE and what for the past, what, several years has been part-time. So... Yes, he's 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 talented and he's got size and he's got credibility, but he needs a lot of work because he's green in how he thinks, especially on his feet. And then I wrote, by the way, this is another one of my fucking notes. As soon as I wrote that, Hager set up simultaneous cold tags and killed the whole heat on Mark Quinn. They got heat on Mark Quinn first because it was a private party or natural athletes, but they're not natural workers. And it got better when they cut Mark Quinn off for the heat and slowed it down and the heels were in control. But then, it, like I said, Hager killed that whole thing when he set up simultaneous cold tags for no fucking reason. Horrible comeback by Cassidy, which consisted of this. <clears throat> a, a modified Thez Press springboard off the top where he just basically sat on fucking uh, Jericho's chest, drop kicked Hager in the shin, Duck Jericho's clothesline and did a springboard backflip into a two count. That was the entire comeback and then lost all the momentum and then started doing some other shit and got back dropped over. Then they went to something else. Rotten comeback. When it, when, when a baby face has sold and sets up his partner for the tag and makes that tag, it should be, as we've mentioned so many times, when it all hope looks lost and there's almost no way he can get that tag and suddenly he does and now the fresh man is in and the heels have to do two things at the same time. They've got to feed that baby face and still look like they're putting the brakes on because they're scared of him. And they got to be in the right position. And the first thing the baby face does or should do is punch that fucking heel in the mouth not duck and dodge. I used to have this in OVW 20 years ago. Guys, you get a hot tag and they jump in and duck and go running and doing a spot that would go to a cross body and something out all this pretty shit. No, the first thing the people want to see from a baby face on a hot tag is to come in and punch the fucking heel square in the fucking face. And then the other one, and then the first one again, and then the next one. If you can't throw a punch, forearm, strikes. Strikes is what they want to see, and they take a bump or two on the strikes. Then you shoot them. Then you run them. Then you backdrop. Then you drop kick. That's the, the Then you bring in the, the higher impact bumps and leaping moves, and then finally you hit a fucking finish. Cover one, two, and maybe the partner makes a save. That's a babyface comeback. You start violent. You're uncorked. You're getting even. Then you pull out big moves. Then you try to beat one of them. The other one has to come in. <clears throat> and then you can continue it from there. You can do whatever. But that's a comeback. Not ducking and dodging and doing some pretty sissy shit. Fuck. And the heels have to feed. Don't go to them. If you go to them, they're doing a shit job of being heels. And it's killed your comeback to begin with. Then they cut Cassidy off and went to the break. So they come back. Now they're getting heat on Cassidy. This is going to be another ridiculously long match with two sets of heat. We didn't do two sets of heat in most of the matches with the Rock and Roll Express. You pull that out every once in a while when you have to go long and it's between two great fucking teams. Private Party can barely get one set of heat and a comeback down 
You're giving them two. Hager used that ridiculous head palm shoot off, and I'm about done with him too. Um, Private Party did some kind of screwy double flip where they were, uh, the guy that was selling, Cassidy, then uh, hang, hung over the top rope and cooperated with his partner to do a double thing that dropped Hager, and then Cassidy went back to selling. Then they did another simultaneous cold tag in the exact same way. They did the same thing wrong the same way twice in the same match. I was gobsmacked that Chris Jericho was involved in this. However, at least Mark Quinn's comeback was much better because Jericho fed him and he bumped Hager out. But then instead of, he makes a comeback. Jericho's legal. Jericho feeds him. Boom, boom, boom. Then he gives Hager the big bump out. And instead of staying in the ring to beat the legal guy, he then runs across the ring, hits the ropes and does a dive outside over the top on Hager that can do him no good whatsoever. Then he gets in the ring and gets a fucking false finish on Jericho for a two count. Well, he should have done that a minute ago. He might've won. Then the uh, private party did another tag and they hit Jericho with more shit. And I'm writing, go home for fuck's sake. Uh, then Hager and Mark Quinn go to the floor. Cassidy hits Jericho with more shit. The, then Hager and Mark Quinn go to the floor and completely disappear. You never see him on camera again. You never see him selling. You never see him trying to climb back in the ring. They're just gone. They entered the fifth dimension with Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. And then Cassidy missed something off the top rope and Jericho hit the Judas. Why even have the tag match when partners have to disappear because your shit's so overly complicated and it's, you're doing too much and it's taking so much time that you can't even do it while your partners are selling. They've got to completely go away. Too much shit in this, too sloppy. It was a mess. Uh, and then Jericho puts Cassidy in the walls of Jericho and Mark Quinn saves by knocking Jericho goofy. So they actually did then did get some heat on the top heels over the fucking middle card tag team. And then one of them comes back and just knocks out the main star. This was rotten and helped nobody. I yield to your thoughts. I can't really add too much to that. I have not liked Jericho and Hagar as a tag team. I don't know why they're in the tag team division. Despite all the issues with Chris Jericho's work in 2020, he's still one of those guys that should be elevated in the singles division, notwithstanding the program at Orange Cassidy. There has to be something better you can do than this. I didn't really <sighs> care much for the match. I, I And that's all these fans out there that buy the drivel that these goofuses straight off the indies feed them think oh it's so great that jericho and hager were trying to do something to help private party out and get them over they think this is it this ain't it you don't get people you don't get anybody over this way having shit like this especially on television anyway the next match for the nwa women's championship thunder rosa defending against ivalice with her partner diamante and I watched this because I had heard that there was talk and suspicion over this contest. And so therefore I even watched the picture in picture. Oh, good. I was, I was waiting for the shoot. I was waiting for the fucking thing to fall apart. And I was waiting for the goddamn, the old fucking hooker moves to come out and this to be a, just a, just fall apart and just goddamn be ugly. It was ugly, all right. But here's the problem. Ivelisse is no Serena Deeb. As we saw, uh, the, the, two, the best girls match in the history of AEW was two girls that were not signed to AEW, Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb. They had a great match. Um, Thunder Rosa then came and had a match with Sheeta, the women's champion here, that was not as good as the previous match. 
but that's because she was doing Sheeta's goofy jumping off the chair at ringside shit and all that outlaw indie stuff that those girls do. But it was much better than this. Was this a shoot? No. This was awkward and sloppy, and it sucked. It looked like different philosophies of what to do. It looked like disagreements because Ivelisse, to me, looked to me like that she was not only awkward to work with but didn't want to be any better because she was uh, being uncooperative. Thunder Rosa got what she could out of her. But no, there was no, there, they were working. They were working. At least anything that I saw, if there was anything edited out, they were being stiff and being awkward and being sloppy, but they were working and it just sucked. And the reason was because apparently it, besides being awkward and klutzy and not very good, Ivelisse also has an attitude problem. Because at one point, she took a snap mare from Thunder Rosa and just sat there while Thunder Rosa was putting a head, uh, hold on her from behind. She's just sitting there like, well, this bitch is not as good as me, which... Anytime you see that, you know that that's the person causing the issue. That's a classic Shawn Michaels, something that he would do. You know that's the person causing the issue. So they just did shit back and forth to each other with no story and no fucking continuity and no flow. It just drug on because it was rotten, but it wasn't a shoot. Finally, Thunder Rosa hit the tombstone and took extra care to make sure that she had her. Because I don't think Ivelisse went up very well, didn't have her gripped right. So she took extra care to make sure she had her and didn't drop her on her head. So it wasn't a shoot, just a lack of cooperation and a bad attitude on the part of the AEW woman. Because apparently, I would imagine that most of those girls in AEW are not happy that here this other girl comes in from another company is automatically the best fucking wrestler in the goddamn division. So they're probably trying to fucking sandbag her ass. And she may be That's the wrong person to do it with. She, is act she actually has an yeah. MMA background. <laughs> well, exactly. Their, their ass will get sandbagged if they sandbag her ass. But, I, but Thunder Rosa was being professional and, and trying to, you could tell she was trying to come up with something and do something because she was try she's trying to get a job and, and further herself. And this other girl was just being fucking snitty and shitty. I don't know which, which, percentage of of it was she's just a klutz and can't work and which percentage of it was she didn't want to that picture in picture where she was just sitting on the mat pouting waiting for thunder rosa to put her in a move like sean michaels didn't even pull that shit oh yeah he did oh okay <laughs> you, you would know see, better than i you didn't see all his matches on television but that was classic sean michaels but um but she just i mean literally it's so yeah. embarrassing if i was behind the scenes if i ran AEW. I would have fired her on the spot. How dare you do that on live? I don't even know if it was live TV. I think it may have been taped, which even raises the question, how this got on the air? Well, because they, the people involved in the production don't know what to look for to edit because they're, they, this is an amateur production. Even though there's experienced people in some places, there shit like this happens and there's no reason not to correct it. And they don't. So I don't know what the fuck, but anyway, but it wasn't a shoot. Everybody, oh, they, they started shooting. And no, they didn't start shooting. They just quit cooperating. How'd you like Sheeta getting in the ring? She has the belt, like a gun belt, like, you know, like around oh, yeah. like a vest. <laughs> I don't, I just fucking quit after that. All right, let's continue moving. Because here's another thing. They, old Miro, Miro, I'm going to call him Miro Mouse. Miro, Mickey, and Minnie Mouse is there with Sabian and, and Ford and he's lifting weights and Sabian's doing shtick. And they have again, pigeonholed this guy, this big git that they've just signed fresh off of the WWE television as a fucking middle card guy doing shtick with the prelim talent. And I don't even know what the fuck he was saying because of his accent. They were trying to do some kind of witty banter, but uh, did you even get what they were talking about? I, I mean, it was. It's been a few yeah. days. It's been a few days yeah. since I watched it. I remember thinking, "Man, Miro looks good here." And then they started doing their shtick, and I'm like, "Oh, that's right, he's doing comedy." 
Well, yeah, that's the thing. He didn't have the Mickey Mouse T-shirt on. He was bench pressing, and he was jacked, and he's got a great body, and he stands up and looks great, and then he opens his mouth, and they're doing their shtick. So he's a, another expensive middle card guy that's going to go nowhere because he doesn't know how to take care of himself. And it, and, and it's, a lot of times it's not these guys' fault. They don't know how to take care of themselves, get themselves over. They've never been asked to or allowed to because they've been spoon-fed and told everything to say and do. But then the problem becomes when they've said that we want to be free of these shackles and chains and get ourselves over, and then they can't because they're not smart enough to turn down bad booking because they don't know what bad booking is, and they don't know how to fucking take matters in their own hands. So this is shit. You got an expensive middle card guy here, Miro. Remember that name. Write it down. You're going to need to. It won't be on the tip of everybody's tongue. Then Lance Archer comes out. With Jake Roberts, what's the first thing Lance Archer did, Brian? I believe he beat up another generic person at ringside, didn't he? Yes, he did. And that would have been great if it hadn't been done 45 minutes previously with four guys. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> no wonder they put the fans up in the bleachers and the fucking job guys down in front. It's not because of COVID. It's because if you go down front, you're going to get beat up on this television program. They just did it with four guys 45 minutes previously. Now Lance does it with one guy. That's going to get him over. They, they shoot their own selves in the foot. I'm not even talking about Lance now. They're telling him to do this, but he's not fucking arguing. Jake knows better than this. Jake sits back there and sees this do the same thing only four times as good than his guy. Half an eight's taking a fucking check. A lot of these guys are taking checks. Jake does his promo and he tried to rip off the Pink Floyd. Did you see? He almost got it. He almost got the opening two lines. He was doing what? Wish you were here, right? He was doing wish you were here, but he he only got he, he he bungled the second line and then added his own verbiage to another line and then quit doing the song entirely. So now we have a little bit of a track record here with Jake and Pink Floyd because when you called him when he no showed you for Smoky Mountain, yes, it was comfortably numb. He was playing on his answering machine. It was, yes, I have become comfortably numb, Jake. Two different if albums. You get, if you get your feeling back, call me and see if you're ever going to come back to work. Is that what you said? <laughs> I, something like that. It's been 25 years. Um, <clears throat> I may not have been that. I was still hoping he might come back because that is only that had only been the third day in a row he no showed. Uh, but, and by the way, I did that promo. He's stealing from me now. I did that promo for fucking Yokozuna against Bret Hart in a cage. It, 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 we're doing a day of promos at TV one day. And it's just the constant local promos. Okay, Rochester, Cleveland, Buffalo, Poughkeepsie, San Francisco, Oakland, Dallas, whatever the fuck. We get to, it was Rochester, Syracuse, or whatever, cage match. Bret Hart versus Yokozuna, WWF title. It says, so, Bret Hart, so you think you can tell heaven from hell? Blue skies from pain? Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail, a smile from a veil? Do you think you can tell? Did they get you to trade your heroes for ghosts? Hot ashes for trees, hot air for a cool breeze, cold comfort for change? Did you exchange, Brett, your walk-on part in a war for a lead role in a cage? And we were out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I was in entertaining myself, but the point is, uh, anyway, Jake, it did the promo either about sleeping with strange people or needing tag team partners. It was, it was strange bedfellows was in there. So here comes Taz who did not need to be standing in the ring next to two guys that are six feet fucking five. Uh, but what the fuck? Now this is another group. Now Taz and brings Starks and Cage. Starks and Cage are going to be Lance Archer's partners with Taz and Jake in the corner uh, in a six-man tag next week. So when Archer wins the title from Moxley in October, then Cage will get the first shot. That's the deal they've made. The heels are working together with each other so that they can fight later. Another group. Uh, suddenly they're interrupted by Stone Cold Cosplays music, who comes out in the arena, of course. But this time, since that's all he ever does, Cage and Starks are ready for him, and they blindside him. 
and after considerable effort, finally get the fucking non-selling bastard down for a second until here comes Will Hobbs with a chair. Now they want to push Will Hobbs. Will Hobbs is giving a good accounting of himself. Uh, nothing wrong with using a new guy. Looks like that. He's big, good looking kid. He did a good job on the TV stuff recently. Nobody showed him how to use the chair. He gets there with the chair and, and fucking cage doesn't feed him anything except standing there. And he's trying to do the fucking pokey edge of chair shots. He's got a fucking chair in his hand. One fucking shot to the fucking head in a safe, responsible manner on either one of the heels that knew how to take it properly would have got that fucking kid over and boom. And the other one catch the fucking heel and they powder. But as it was, he gives cage a couple of shitty pokes with the chair and then swings it at shit. He can hit as they duck out of the way and then makes noise. And then Moxley introduces everybody to, of course, he Boxley, after being mugged by these two top heels, he was back up and speaking within seconds and introduced Hobbs and asked Darby Allen to come from the skateboard jungle or wherever he lives next week for the six man tag. Once again, a good thing to use Will Hobbs. Don't send him out there without showing him how to use the gimmick that you've handed him. And this was a, this was all some convoluted shit. And the guys are now just making their own fucking matches. This, oh, I'm going to wrestle you next week. And hey, Darby, if you're home, I got your phone number, but I'll just tell you now, uh, you come on down and you can have them. You can be our partner. We'll have a match with, they're just doing it themselves. This is the most amateur fucking production I've ever seen in my life. Which leads me to the main event. I don't know. Wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't get your thoughts on, on this, another heel group uh, with another heel group, fight heels, fighting heels promo. Did you understand all of this? I thought this was one of the best things on the episode. Now, again, there was a lot of shit on this episode, <laughs> but with the exception of Moxley coming through the side door, which thankfully the music guy knew was about to happen. And also Moxley had a mic already. Yeah. I don't know who preps him before he comes out of the various orifices of the arena. But other than that, I thought it was all right. Ricky Stark sitting behind him and then attacks him. Cage runs in. I've told you before, very high on Ricky Starks and cage really like Taz. I agree with you about Taz, who I think is like five, six or five, seven being in there with Jake and Archer. But they're setting something up here. You know, we'll work together reluctantly, and we have a deal. If you win, we get a shot. I like the fact that they're elevating Will Hobbs. I haven't seen very much of him, but the little bit I've seen of him, he has a lot of potential. I thought this was one of the least bad things on the show. <laughs> it was one of the, it was the second least bad match. Uh, um, <laughs> I thought it was all, no, all things no, considered on the show. I thought this was all right. Again. Yes, I agree with you about the good points of it, but why do they have to do the dumb shit first? That, that you know, uh, all right. Anyway, let's get to the one people want to hear, apparently. I have heard, I, I stayed away from looking at anything. I stayed away from watching anything about this parking lot fight until I actually watched it so I could form somewhat of my own opinion, except that I, it was unable to be avoided that uncle Dave bestowed on this. I can't say match on this segment, the first five star rating he's given since the pandemic. So that's a, a big fucking day. Apparently he didn't give it to Adam Cole and fucking Finn Balor. Apparently he didn't give it to, Rhea Ripley and Mercedes Martinez. Apparently he didn't give it to any of the number of the matches that we praised to the heavens. Apparently he didn't give it to, apparently he didn't give it to fucking Flair and Sting ever. Somebody had a list of all the matches that Daniel Bryan has apparently not had a five-star match. Uh, over the last 30 years, all the people that didn't get five stars, they listed, but this got five stars. <sighs> I watched it as a spectacle without making notes until afterwards so that I wouldn't be distracted. 
And there were some things. God damn, how to explain this? It's like you fuck something up so bad that nobody wants to see it fixed. A relationship, a goddamn television show, fucking something's gone off the rails. And then when they've reached the point of no return and nobody gives a shit, they actually do something halfway good. I guess is because here's the conceptual problems that I have. This whole angle was started as a comedy thing and presented in a way that nobody could ever believe it that it was all a hoot and it's revenge over Trent's mom's minivan. You're doing this with mid card guys, the butt buddies, the best friends or whatever middle card to be generous. You're not doing this with main event performers. You're doing this on free television, not pay-per-view. You're doing this in an empty arena era where there's no way to sell tickets to this or to rematches. This is this was a long angle. Remember, we've talked about the location fight rule. When the match gets out of hand and then goes out in the parking lot or out in the arena or out in the concourse or out in the concession stand or whatever, when it gets out of hand like that, that's shooting an angle to want to see a rematch that could get out of hand in your, in your mind even worse. And the longer you stay in that cool location for the fight, the more people have seen it and don't want to see any more of it. So your clock is ticking there too. You've got the inherent dangers of real glass and steel because these were real fucking cars. So they're doing it on free television in the empty arena era where there's no tickets to be sold from any rematches or for this, a long angle instead of a blow off with middle card talent especially and even if you want to uh, elevate Santana and Ortiz because they're members of the inner circle, nobody says that fuck Taylor and Trent, one name only, are fucking main event guys. Nobody with any sense. Nobody with any experience. It, but then, after all of that, then they go out there and were serious for the first time and stiff and no outright silly shit, and nobody running over their crotch with the fucking football field marker, and they legitimately hurt each other. This is the most ass-backward shit I've ever seen in my life. If they were going to do anything, why weren't they serious and legitimate and really mad and violent at the start to hook the people to want to see anything, any other developments in the program. And then maybe they could have got a little silly on the blow off, but instead they make everything a goddamn clown show until they get to the fucking blow off match. And then they almost kill each other. Taylor still looks and moves like a goof that fucking does not change, but everybody else in here, did a great job. I did get a fucking tickle on the giant wall mural saying it's nicer here while they're having a goddamn rumble in the parking lot. But they did the, the fucking, and it's cool. It was a great movie scene. It was counterproductive to anything you would ever want to do with professional wrestling, but it was a great movie fight scene. But here's the thing. Why? How will this make any money in the long run? How will this make any money for anybody in the long run? How can you top this? Do more? Break more cars? Get bigger, harder cars with more glass? How does an in-ring finish mean anything now when anybody does it, when they've been whacking each other over the heads with fucking boards and fucking pile drivers on cars, etc.? How does a foreign object uh, cheating in a wrestling match mean any cheating? Just cheating of any kind at a wrestling match mean anything else after they've had a street brawl for 15 minutes in the parking lot. Like I said, every part of this was set up to be phony, funny, or silly. And when they had made sure that everybody knew that and talked about Trent's mom, then they get violent. Then the announcers sell it like a blood feud. They double power bomb Trent through a real windshield and almost break his neck in the process, by the way, and it's not the finish. 
But then he comes out bleeding from the back profusely. It was like garbage deathmatch wrestling with a fucking budget once you saw that. And then, just when I was ready to say, all right, they hoped this whole goddamn thing up, but at least on the blow-off, they worked as hard as they could. They were serious. They did the closest thing they could come to, I guess, in this environment to an actual fight in a parking lot and stayed away from silly bullshit. Then my little dog Pockets comes out of a fucking trunk of a car at just the right time and knocks out Santana with one fucking shot with a gimmick after he'd just been hit by 18 things over and over, hands him off to fuck Taylor and the butt buddies double pile drive the heels on cars next to each other and double pin them. So they even at the end had to spoil what they had accomplished after nearly killing themselves to do it by bringing out the goof and making the finish funny and gaga and bullshit. He didn't need to be there. They could have done this on their own. They were getting some respect and getting taken seriously. And then out pops the goof. And then just to make sure that even for the fans of my little dog pockets that liked seeing him, but otherwise they could say, wow, what a fight. Hey, boy, bow, Jesus Christ. Here comes Trent's mom in a minivan, pulls up, and they all get in the minivan, and, he, and she drives them off. In what universe was this good or entertaining or productive or conducive to future business or good for ratings or to sell the non-existent tickets they can't sell or anything Otherwise, than nearly to kill these four fucking guys and still make a joke out of it when they're all still bleeding and it's hardly even over with. Just fu And this is what Uncle Dave now thinks is a five-star wrestling match is contrived, dangerous bullshit with preliminary talent that somehow manages to stay serious all the way through the thing until at the end when they ruin it on purpose to make a joke out of the fucking finish and the fucking drive off into the sunset with Trent's mom's minivan. Fuck all of you. I, I was sorry. I was feeling sorry for them that they were taking those bumps and hitting each other with shit and obviously fucking beating the piss out of each other. And they'd been the victims of such rotten booking up till now that nobody was still going to give a shit or believe it. And then they all cooperate with that. Fuck all y'all. And Dave Meltzer, you can suck my big fat white cock. If you think this was five star anything, you are goddamn demented, son. You have completely, you haven't lost your mind because you know better. What you've lost is your principles and your integrity. Because it's more important to you that the cool kids like you than to tell people when you're seeing fucking shit. This was ridiculous. It, it, every compliment I could possibly give these people was taken away by shit that was preventable, by just they couldn't be serious about anything, even in this instance, when they really were about to fucking paralyze each other. That's what I, 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 I don't understand this whole goddamn thing. I don't know why anybody would do this. I don't know why a promoter would allow this to be done. I don't know what the point of it is, what the end result is supposed to be, how they're going to make some money off of it. Or how, how have they just not killed their goddamn company for anybody to do anything else to each other? What else can you sell? A cannonball? Pull me out of this. Well, let me start by saying it certainly wasn't five stars to me. Like I said last week, you could take a star and a half, or even, I guess, a star and a quarter, depending on what it is, off Dave's ratings to adjust them for inflation. So I would say maybe three and a half to three and three quarter stars as a brawl, as a spectacle. It was good as a brawl. Like you said, you have to forget the fact that it's been a silly feud with a silly premise behind it. And it was so good, I was actually able to forget that until the finish, when it got silly again. Santana continues to impress me. Yeah. Chuck Taylor didn't do anything terrible <laughs> in this. I mean, it, they were all really good here, until Orange Cassidy popped out of the trunk, 
And then the whole thing with his mom and then the camera stays on them because obviously she's going to give them the finger out of the minivan. Well, thank God my DVR cut off. I didn't see the finger from mom. Yeah, she gave a middle finger to, uh, well, I guess to us, the audience. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, that, 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 on behalf of on behalf of myself and the group, here's what they think of all of us. If you were stupid enough to sit here for two hours and watch that shit, here you go. You can't tell me they couldn't have done a feud with these two teams and made it somewhat serious building to this as the end of the feud. Very easily they could have. Of In- course. Instead, it's been this silly feud with stolen gear and a minivan of the guy's mom destroyed, and he's going to apologize to his mom. With that said, it was good for what it was. I liked it until Orange Cassidy popped up, and I remember that this is all a joke. This is a joke feud. And that was AEW this week. Wrestling for kids by kids. But calling this f- right. calling this five stars just I okay oh, that's just I ludicrous. Don't. And and then even if if you get into the fact that there is an art form to professional wrestling and leading the people on the emotional roller coaster and putting in an athletic performance, and then also there's garbage death match wrestling where you just whack each other with a bunch of shit for no fucking reason till somebody loses, and this was performed well for that. Most of the fucking deathmatch garbage wrestlers can't do anything. These guys, they did it fairly well, but they ended up shitting the bed and meant nothing. And to say that it's five stars of a performance in relation to professional wrestling, like I said, it may be a five-star movie scene. I bet you there's not any stuntmen in Hollywood that could have done all that in one take. I guarantee you there's not. And I think that's where these guys ought to fucking go and find suitable employment because their wrestling fucking sucks. Five stars for a for a wrestling measurement. Yeah. I, I, he compared the, it to DiBiase and Duggan in Houston. Oh, good Lord. Oh, for fuck's sake. He's lost his fucking mind and it's sad and he's embarrassing himself now and more people are picking up on it. There was no art to this. It was just <laughs> go out and potato each other for a while and then double pile drivers. There was no art. There was no talent. What it was was done better than the average garbage wrestler out on the independence, but it just gives them more fucking ideas that, that somehow this has something to do with wrestling. And this is what wrestling's about. And that's why I'm down on the complete modern generation because they, they, every time they do shit like this, they tell the fans, this is what it's supposed to be like. And it's only because in most cases, one of two cases with AEW, they either the talent is not able to do it right or elsewise, the booking will not allow them to. If, if, if you're working for somebody and you don't have that much experience to begin with, and they tell you, oh, we want you to go out and do this. Okay. You're going to go out and do it. Cause you've seen all these other outlaw goofy wrestling shows. And you think that's what you're supposed to do. And there's nobody here to fucking yank this back and say, what the fuck? No. So uh, anyway, your closing thoughts. Cause I'm ready to close. I didn't especially enjoy either show this week, by and large. There were segments I liked. I liked the Damian Priest match. I liked the Taz crew Moxley segment. I liked the FTR match. FTR are fantastic. Champa. Champa was good. I like. I'm looking forward to Champa and O'Reilly. Uh, MJF segment I thought was really good. I love Eddie Kingston on the mic. Never want to hear Omega on the mic again. <laughs> Never want to see Alex Marvez on the mic again. Thunder Rosa and Ivelisse, I couldn't judge it fairly because I had heard too much before I watched it. So I was kind of watching it for the alleged shoot that broke out, this fucking Hackenschmidt gotcha yeah. match. Yeah, boy, these, these fucking <laughs> modern shoots are a letdown too. <laughs> you know, the guys used to know how to fucking get into it, but no more. Do you want to talk about the ratings? What are they? I don't even know. All right, hold on. Let me pull this up. 
The ratings for this past week, which is the first time they've been head to head in better part of a month. NXT 689, AEW 886. 200,000 difference. Well, I'll tell you, the other interesting thing is the week before, unopposed, AEW cracked a million. A million, 16,000. And NXT did 800 and something thousand. 838,000, also unopposed. But head-to-head, AEW lost hundred and uh, ooh, about 130,000 uh, subscribers, I have to say. Subscri- Viewers. And NXT is back in that range they have been in for a long time, between 650 and 750. Well, they both lost 150,000 by being a, a... See, that's that's interesting. AEW did a million for the first time since the first show, unopposed. NXT did 800 and uh, whatever you said, almost 900,000 unopposed. 838. 838. They come back opposed and don't do as many people in total together. But there's uh, there's a there's 200,000 fucking floaters around. I, I still say that's the cult of Cornette members that are just watching this to fucking hear what we're going to say. Because why else actually would you watch any of this shit, to be honest with you? But it is what it is. There they are. It's the same group switching back and forth. One likes one, one likes the other, and you got the floaters. And as long as they, as Dutch Mantel said one time, if you always do what you always did, then you always get what you always got. And I can tell very few of these fucking television shows apart from each other. They're all doing the same shit over and over. For my sensibilities, both shows have a difficult time when you think they have a good episode. They have a difficult time coming back the next week and repeating it. I have I have noticed, especially with NXT, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Even AEW, the episodes that I've enjoyed the next week, it's like, what what happened? <laughs> but NXT especially. NXT gives you one episode, you're like, wow, this is great. And then the next week, it's like, I forgot. And then the next week is 20 minutes of fucking Shotzi in the tank. All right. <laughs> I'm going in the tank. Uh, the drive through coming up, as we've mentioned, watch along Hogan Rock WrestleMania 18 and talk discussion of the new Ring of Honor format, which I have high hopes to see. I'm going to be seeing shortly. And then the uh, that's the drive through on Wednesday. The experience this week at our normal time. What are they going to do this Wednesday night? Uh, the the drive through next week on Tuesday instead of Monday uh, because we need extra time to process more information and all kinds of good stuff coming up in the future. Is that right? I don't know how good it'll be, but. Oh, well, thanks for the full-throated endorsement. All right, Harley's got a piss, and so do I. (laughs) Folks, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the birthday wishes. We will see you again on the next program very soon. Until then, thank you, fuck you, bye-bye, and ta-ta for now, everybody.